Nerves are starting to get up, the anxiety rising. Kyle Bush leads them off of turn four, waiting for that starter to wave the green flag. We're underway here in New Hampshire. bit of the racetrack. They did not apply any PJ1 like they have here in years past, but there is still some residual grip there from that PJ1 in the top groove and the very bottom groove. The middle never had any PJ1 applied, so it's still usable for part of the racetrack, but the drivers will enter high and then exit low off the corners to get drive off. Let's watch this 12 car, Ryan Blaney. Why is it so hard to pass here? All the way to the bottom of the racetrack. But down there, the track does not have the grip it has above that. Nice move to clear the car, the, the red car there of Bell, but now still a battle with Hamlin. Bell all in the back, now a oh, stack up. Yeah. Larson into the back. Larson almost in the back of the eight car. They're very careful to not get any damage. We see stack ups here all the time, particularly on restarts. We had a big one yesterday in the Xfinity race. Happens a lot at these tracks. The bottom groove was really good early in the run yesterday. Christopher Bell, a guy who we saw learn a lot in the Xfinity race yesterday, trying to move through this field, take advantage of what he learned before all these other guys catch up. The very first lap of the race, let's ride right along with the 22 of Joe Logano. Watch the 21 car on the outside, drives in the corner. Gets on the brakes, got really loose car, hit those bumps, saw it bottom out. Incredible save. Usually that ends up in a wrecked race car, but those bumps are very difficult to get across. Car wants to wheel hop or lock up the tires across those bumps getting into turn three. You do not have that issue into turn one. See William Byron completing the pass for the 21 of Matt DeBedadetto. Now running that middle lane, trying to keep that momentum on corner exit. 21 to kind of contest continue on the inside down in that left rear. you guys talk about into this rough oh you see the left front sparking that's how rough the racetrack is that'll get better as that air pressure we discussed builds up in the tires then it's kind of the that's like the slide up with mittens on right i didn't hit you but you see me coming you're gonna have to leave me a little bit of room in the really good just be easy here oh, oh we got a car on the wall that's two cars true it's two raining cars. raining yeah, in turn one it all of a sudden started rain all of a sudden just started raining really quickly in turn one Bunch of the leaders right had trouble. Bunch of the guys up front. Kyle Busch leading the race. First one to the corner in the rain. You see the damage. Heavy damage to the 18 car. The 19 of Truex, another Joe Gibbs Toyota. I think Hamlin has some damage too. Some damage on the 42 car. Ross Chastain. Hamlin was backwards down in the middle of one and two. Not sure if he had any contact with any other cars. Yeah, Denny Hamlin said his car is damaged, and it was raining a good lap and a half before that. So that's what all the drivers, of course, are going to talk about when uh, we do have a chance to talk to them, is it's still raining here on Pitt Road. Heavy damage to the 18. I'm not sure this is even repairable. And where they're at currently with multiple wins on the season, I'm just not sure, you know, the value oh he's got the wind in that now pushing the pace car I don't believe I would do that yeah I wouldn't either it's definitely gonna draw the attention in NASCAR there I guess the frustration let's take a look you know how this started why this started but look at the lack of grip yeah first. everybody in the corner way up the track four cars back here with contact Kyle Busch just drives in the corner, expecting to have grip, and it's just not there. Track's wet. Big damage. I've drove cars for two decades, and I'm shocked at the lack of grip. That, you know, I know that it's raining pretty hard out there. We're in a we're in a booth, and we don't really know exactly how much participation is coming down. But I am shocked at the lack of grip 
that those cars have on that surface out there. So when you talk about how NASCAR makes a decision whether the track should stay green or not, they have both someone on the roof with the spotters, they have the flag man, they also have workers spread around the racetrack. They report into the tower on whether there should be rain or there should not be rain. And it's a little surprising to me that it could change that quickly at a one-mile racetrack. You know, a Pocono, a Michigan, a road course, Road America, huge facilities. It's hard to tell what can happen at the other side of the racetrack, but it was very clear by the amount of devastation we see right here the track was too wet to continue i just don't know without understanding all the radio from nascar what the officials in the tower knew Whoa. Oh. well what's even more makes it even more challenging steve is they just went through three and four and nobody had trouble down you know in three and four yeah. then they went in one and two and you saw everybody that was early had trouble and the, the rest of the guys could react to that and get slowed down Let's listen to Denny Hamlin's in car. Uh, so the caution. Wait, but they're blood racks. So the caution. It's been raining from the beginning. It's been raining since the beginning of the race. I think NASCAR is trying to keep the cars on the racetrack, keep it running, hoping that uh, the situation would take care of itself. But unfortunately, uh, we've got some drivers that are going to have uh, have a lot of comments and opinions about that decision. Well, and as a competitor, you're relying on NASCAR to make that call, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one but thing you got to keep say, racing. Right. It's Great one thing to say, well, you should have just slowed down. Well, nobody else is going to slow down, and you're relying on them to make that call, and clearly they didn't make the call as quickly as they needed to. Yeah, track, track conditions overall have been a point of conversation on multiple weeks this, this year. I mean, here it was whether, whether the track was dry enough to continue. You go back to Coda, the question was, was the rain too heavy to continue? You know, conditions on the racetrack and the communication between the drivers and NASCAR has definitely been uh, a point of conversation this year. Yeah. Yeah, look at the radar. There's not like a, a sail that's been on its way here. It's pop-up stuff around the racetrack that you see it. I'm with you, Junior. I'm shocked that it got that slick that Fast. quickly. From where we are, I mean, we're we're on top of the grandstands in a booth looking onto the racetrack and I didn't even know it was raining. I could not see out the windshield that it was right out of the window that it was raining. Shocked that it was raining that entire time. You know, we run here for years and years and as competitors and as broadcasters, we see we see guys, you know, one small mistake in the corner and it's all it takes at this track to find yourself in the fence. A bobble, a, lo a lock up or anything. We see guys going to backup cars in practice to have practice here we'd have four or five guys going to backup cars with issues in practice just making mistakes and so forth and so there's very very minimal room if none for an error or any kind of issue like that so any kind of dampness on the track at this particular track uh i can kind of see how this would have the result that it had thinking about how easily it is to get in trouble here we, we just started the show talking about kyle bush right here the guy that could take the momentum away. He has been taking the fight to Hendrick Motorsports, and now he's sitting there saying, I had nothing to do with this. I had a chance to win this race. I had a chance to change the momentum of this championship, and here I am done, potentially done for the day. It could have done nothing different, and that, I don't. I understand. He's going to be frustrated, and I understand. That's the point of the frustration, right, is, is as a competitor, you want to be able to make some notes about how you could do something different. I, what do you tell the 18, the 19, the 11? I mean, you see the nine going straight up the track as well. I guess he had a little bit of a heads up that, because he saw the two in front of him not make the corner. Look behind, a really nice job of, see Matty D, William Byron. Chastain was up the racetrack yep. and didn't make contact. All those guys did a nice job not piling into each other. So yes, there is gonna be some major frustration. Fun during the rain delay. Always expect these two guys out there throwing the football. Gunner. That was a solid play right yeah, there. Yeah, pretty nice. So, uh, there's Corey right there. Oh, see, I we knew, knew he yeah. was going to need some ice. I knew he was slinging that thing up there too hard. Didn't need to rest. Ice it up. We got a rain delay. Now the guys are getting back out on the racetrack here, getting, the car, getting back to their cars. And it is going to be about 5 o'clock or just a little bit after before we get back to green. 
uh, just a few hours, three hours possibly before sundown. Uh, is that plenty of time for us to get this race in and, and what kind of other things are the teams dealing with in this situation? So it normally takes about three hours to run this race. So we're going to be right against darkness. So we'll have to wait and see. Like if, if, if darkness starts coming and this race gets run longer, NASCAR will have to make some kind of decision on how to deal with that. But you know right now you're pushing it, right? And right. How, how are you going to have to deal with it? You don't know right now. It may not be a problem. So don't fix it unless there is well, a problem, right? That's what I was going to say is I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. We're going to worry about that later. Right now it's all about trying to get back in your routine. This isn't even really like a rain delay halfway through. We've only run eight laps. So while some cars are affected, the majority of the field got a little eight laps of practice, and that's it. So my biggest concern now is I'm making sure my driver's re-engaged. Whatever our normal pre-race routine is, we're probably going back through it again, making sure the pit crew guys didn't get a little lax, make sure we know the tires are dry, the lug nuts are dry. You know, this is a short race regardless if we run to completion or not. It doesn't matter. The point is, is you know, if you have a hiccup, good luck trying to dig yourself out of a hole in an only a 300 lap race. I mean, it yeah. is hard to do. Well, you see pit road just a little bit damp. They'll soon fix that up as soon as they can get the cars off the pit road and onto the racetrack. We got weepers down in turn one and two that they've been working on all morning long. They've been cutting into the racetrack, trying to release some of that water pressure. They've been using the, the blowers here to, to some effect. And uh, you have to imagine that that could be uh, the only thing that really would drag this delay out. And we're hearing now from NASCAR that there was a scheduled lap 30 competition yellow. Uh, they basically said, look, you got to, this is the comp yellow. You have the opportunity to now pit, put fuel in, which is the big difference. Uh, and I think that's them, Jeff, looking at the same time of day as we are. It's like, listen, these guys may wreck 20 times. We can't change that. We're not going to give you the freebie. We're not, we're going to leave that one in our pocket. All right, so we knew that some guys in the race last year stayed out at that comp yellow at lap 30, lap 20. At lap eight, is any, I mean, right now, is anybody coming to pit road to do anything, get gas or? I think the only reason you would come is if something in the first eight laps felt so poorly, so off that you've had now an hour or so to figure out, hey, we're gonna make some adjustments. We have this plan. We're gonna make big packer changes, but you know, maybe a big car change, but strategy wise, there would be no reason I would come back down pit road. See, Alex Bowman putting on his heat shields. Gives them a little protection. The floorboards in these cars still get really, really hot without those heat shields. You get blistered up heels. Really uncomfortable. Especially at a track where you have a lot of brakes. All that brake temperature, those brakes get to 1,000, 1,500 degrees, and all that temperature is coming through the firewall into the right into the boot of that heel. See, I think, I think your point about getting refocused is really important. I mean, this race. It's, you know, we only ran eight laps, right? Just a few laps on the green, and you got an idea what your car was like. You got a chance to sit down with your team and say, okay, here's what I'm dealing with. And now you've had it, now the team's had a chance to really start thinking about, okay, here's what he's dealing with, here's what maybe we can change. But also, they also, this track's gonna change a lot. From where it is right now to where it's gonna be when the, the checkered flag falls, there's gonna be a ton of rubber built up on this racetrack. There's so many unknowns going into today been forever since we ran this racetrack without the traction compound on it. So this just adds to the questions, in my opinion, uh, because that early comment I made to you as a driver, this is what my car is doing, you know it's going to completely be oh, yeah. different 100 laps from now. Yeah, I was only taken with a grain of salt even without the rain and the jet dryers that early in the race. And we, we got to remember, when we look at the playoff standings entering this race, five races, including this one, remain in the regular season. We have 12 names, a lot of names that are in yellow for winning the race. Denny Hamlin comfortably in all points, but Denny and Harvick, they've got to they gotta think they have to win a race before the playoffs to at least have some momentum. But now with some big name, Kyle Busch is out, Mark Drex Jr. damaged. Let's just assume he seemed like his car wasn't gonna be good enough. We'll take his word for that. You have to ask, you know, is this the chance for Hamlin or Harvick or I didn't have Kurt Busch, guys, last week. I, I'll admit it. I, I, I was wrong. He proved to us they could win a race. Who else? Are we Are we maybe not giving Reddick or Busher, Matty D? Can he off, you know, overcome the news of the week? Kind of like, hey, that's what Kurt Busch did. They bought his team, bad news, and he went to victory lane. Well, and, and this is a track Matty D could run well in and have a chance to win. He's run well here in the past, been one of his best racetracks. Penske's been really fast here. So, yes, I think they came into this race thinking this is our best chance for the rest of the regular season to get a win. So it, it and listen, it's never easy. 
but it got a tiny, teeny little bit easier with two of the big names falling out of this race early. Yeah, I think one guy that is on that list outside the bubble is Ross Chastain, and he's not only looking to win a race and prove to everybody he belongs here, but he's also trying to, you know, secure his next ride. Right. We know that he doesn't have a contract right now going into next year with the sale of Ganassi to Trackhouse, so he's trying to audition for maybe a ride at Trackhouse or somewhere else. So he's very confident, wants to be here, and we know that he will do whatever it takes. <laughs> we know that he's aggressive on the racetrack, and just like Kurt Busch, He's shown more pace in the last five or six weeks. So I think he's a guy that could surprise and win a race. He's got pace. He might have pace here today, but he's also been really quick at the road courses, which has been a surprise too. Dale Jarrett and I were standing down on the grid pre-race before the pre-race show came on. And he was looking down in turn one. He said, you remember when the whole kind of run this race backwards pit strategy started, you know, like, hey, we're gonna run that long, that last set of tires really long. He goes, that was a day I had a car I thought could win the race. And all of a sudden, there's some guys that just stay on the racetrack and they beat us. And I bring that up because that's what can happen here. You can have a great car. You can have an awful car. And we can see a string of cautions in the last 60 or 70 laps, and it can change the entire complexion. I'm not willing to call this a wild card because I think anybody who can win here is an impressive race car driving a race team. But I think it is much less predictable than at some of the other racetracks we go to talking about Ross Chastain. Last week, Atlanta Motor Speedway, Ross Chastain was close to going a lap down. His teammate said, hey, I want the bottom. So Ross Chastain decided to give him the bottom. But when he did that, he took the groove away from Kyle Busch. Kyle Busch was not happy to race, but not happy after the race. But the result, Kurt Busch going around his brother to get the win with the assist from his teammate, Ross Chastain. Ross Chastain being Really good to, I'd say, a great teammate. <laughs> Everybody high-fiving him. Kyle Busch didn't agree. He didn't think it was so cool. I think Ross's comment was pretty clever where he said, well, I gave my, you know, Kurt the bottom. He asked for the bottom. So yep. I gave him the, the bottom of the track, and that's <laughs> he's telling the truth without really telling a lie. So it's pretty interesting. He was quick to, quick to have that uh, quip ready to deliver. Well, I watched uh, a couple things posted on NASCAR social media, and they had a great replay with the spotter audio. And the spotter down the backstretch was saying, hey, you know, your teammate wants the bottom. So, I, I mean, it was definitely without, I won't say it was without controversy. Kyle didn't like it. Other drivers, I'm sure, didn't like it. But in the end, he controls his own race car. And as you said, he's driving for a job. So maybe he's auditioning for another owner. So look at me. I'm a team player. I'm the guy. You hire me, and I'm going to be part of the team. I think one guy you said that you thought could win here today, Steve, was William Byron, and Marty's caught up with him down the pits. Yeah, let's chat with William Jr. As uh, you mentioned, drivers trying to get refocused before they strap in the car here. So how does one kind of refocus after eight laps of chaos and then a bit of a rain delay? It's tough. I mean, honestly, not much to look at or, or review. So, uh, you know, our Liberty University Chevy felt OK. You know, we were, we were loose, but we, I think we were loose in the water spots mostly. So uh, I feel like we've, we're going to have a fast race car today. We've been fast at all the 750 tracks. So just got to go out there and, and feel it out. Um, feel like I can get more aggressive with it now that the track is dry. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So I saw you kind of looking at the racetrack wondering, well, is it dry? Is it actually dry? How aggressive do you play this restart then? Are you going to be honestly a little cautious to at least start? You know, I, th I think honestly it felt like low air pressure plus moisture before, whereas I feel like now you're just going to have that low air pressure New Hampshire feel that the car kind of walks around for a couple laps. So. Honestly, for us, just try to get through that that segment, hopefully get some some more heat in my rear tires. I know I didn't get a lot of heat in them uh, to take off there. So try to do a little bit more better job of that and, and see what we have. So I was talking to Kyle Larson before the race. We were talking about how you all had been chatting about how Hendrick, it's been a race, tough racetrack for Hendrick Motorsports. Yeah. Kind of what's been missing, you feel like, for Hendrick here? Just the turn. You know, we just, we just have to get our cars to turn. I feel like we... I feel like this week we took a little different approach uh, to get it to turn. And, um, you know, it's it's so tough because you don't want to be out of the track with the rears and, and you want it to turn. It's, it's like the perfect balance, uh, the toughest racetrack to do that at. So uh, hopefully our car turns well today and we can, um, you know, have that kind of magic that it takes here in New Hampshire. So we talked about NASCAR kind of making this a competition caution. If you look at pit road, Brad, let's show pit road. It's wet still. So pit road still has a lot of drying to do. So that's one of the reasons NASCAR smart call to say, hey, you know what? Let's give that a little bit more time to dry. Pit road still very wet, Dylan. 
And Marty, we saw Martin Truex Jr.'s issues and heard from him uh, just a little while ago after that incident on the racetrack. So the crew is waiting and they can't obviously work on repairing this damage until the red flag is lifted, which we expect to come any minute. So Martin is behind the wheel of the race car and talking with James Small, the crew chief. He has been up on the box since we got back out here, since the rain stopped and really since it started. He's been up on the box overseeing the race car, making sure that they have a plan in place so that as soon as they can go to work on this race car, they're as efficient as they can be to lose as little time on pit road as possible. So the left front is going to be the main area of emphasis you can see down at the bottom of the car there on the left front the splitter or the, the the bottom of the car has kind of been ripped away so that's dragging when martin drives onto the racetrack which is uh is obviously not a good thing so that's going to be the main area of emphasis they got all four corners damaged though so they got some rear damage to work on they've got some right side damage to work on but this left front is going to be the primary area of focus and hopefully they can get it sorted out and truex will be able to get back on the racetrack and, and contend so that's the main the main goal for these guys right now and Right now, they're just waiting on that yellow flag to wave so they can get to work. Well, pep talk there by Dylan. They got all four corners damaged. But I want to go back to William Byron. He said here at the 750 track, so he's talking about that's the horsepower. We're back at these types of tracks where they have all their horsepower, right? They're not really restricted down anymore. They have 750 horsepower, low downforce, and the teams kind of categorize those, right? Certain tracks 750, certain tracks 550. I think you saw right off the top of his head, that's what he was referring to, and you see for Martin Truex Jr., this DVP time remaining three minutes and 50 seconds. Basically, that's total time allowed on pit road. You start at six minutes. The only way to get rid of that clock, it doesn't reset it. It throws it away. It doesn't exist anymore if he can go reach minimum speed. Unless, unfortunately, he gets in another incident, then he'll start again at six minutes. You know, we were just talking to William Byron, and you know, William Byron's year, Steve, has been really good. I mean, he's, he's done a really nice job. The last three races haven't gone very well, but prior mm -hmm. to that, William Byron and this team have quietly had a really, really strong year. You see this 24 car in the front five a lot, and they've just done, they've had such an improvement this year. Williams doing a nice job. Yeah, I mean, when you go back and look at Hendrick Motorsports' decision, Rudy Fugel coming to join the 24. We don't know where this car's gonna land in the playoffs, but but that could be the move of the year so far for the 24. Yeah, I mean, hearing the, the Hendrick. Hearing the fans getting fired up, that can mean only one thing, the drivers Starting to crank the engines on these cars. Or it's you making fun of me about track drying, which well, I'm just going to say it's not dry yet. I haven't thrown the towel in yet. Well, I, listen, I'm keeping a timer. So okay. right now, good, good. <laughs> right now, by the time they go green, I'm going to say Steve's going to be closer to winning this bet. I don't think that's really what the bet was, but. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to lose this one. Yeah. I won't lie. I'd like to see these cars get going again. Everything's a competition up here. Well, the fun thing is, while they're, you know, the, the cars are on pit road, and that's slowing down the process of drying up the front half of pit road, but the entrance to pit road, they're getting ready. They have been working on that, and that's actually drying pretty well. Looks like they moved on from turn one where the weepers were uh, and have that taken care of pretty well. Once we can get the cars out there and circling around, creating a little bit of heat of their own, get pit road dialed in, should be throwing the green flag. We, we talk about jet dryers. We've got two different types of jet dryers. That one was the old fashioned. Actually, it's a jet engine just strapped to the back of the truck, blowing hot air onto the racetrack, drying it up. We also have the air titans that just blow air, just compress the air across the racetrack to move the water off. They don't do as good of a job of getting, dry, getting wet spots dried up. They just move the water. They remove the red, display the yellow. So that means the crew in the 19th get to work, what Dylan Welch was just talking about, and that means the rest of the field can roll off. I always get a little nervous in these situations as a crew chief. I want to see my engine fire. I want to hear my radio communication work. I want to make sure all the parts and pieces are still working. Let's listen in to uh, the number five driver, Kyle Larson. And they just announced to the field that they may shorten the race depending on time and or weather or both. So they said they're going to try to get it in like normal, but if it gets too dark or if rain comes back, they will call it short. Okay. Well, Jeff, that's what you talked about. That's NASCAR letting the field know that, hey, you know, sunset's around 820. We're going to do everything we can, but we want to let you know what we have going on. And we've been in these situations before. You know, I remember time, one time at Charlotte Motor Speedway, we went late into the night. One time at uh, Atlanta, we, or maybe Texas, we went late into the night. I'd like to say that one great rule change that NASCAR made 
is the official race used to be the end of stage two, not so much anymore. And they came back and said, ah, that might be a little long. What we're going to do is the end of stage two or halfway, whichever is sooner. So here, at this race, it would simply be the halfway mark at lap 150. Remember, no lights here, so we need daylight to run. Yeah, getting to watch Truex's boys go to work, try to repair that car. He's going to pull off pit road before the pace car comes by and puts them a lap down. They're trying to stay 22. on the lead lap. The 22 car, though, coming on to pit road. Joe Logano, yeah. I, I, I'm really shocked by this. Well, they're gonna they're gonna pit Steve because they think they have a piece of rubber that might be caught somewhere. They're gonna go under the hood and it might be somewhere near maybe the throttle linkage and they're worried there might be a hung throttle situation. And actually they just came on the radio as he was coming down pit road and said if we pit here, we might get a two lap penalty. So they're saying asking Joey to check the throttle. Joey gave him a thumbs up. I'm gonna ask Paul Wolf exactly what all is going on here, but they really felt like they had to come down pit road here and get that situation fixed. Well, pit road is closed. So, I mean, there's And they told him it'd be a two lap penalty if they came down pit road. So that's gonna be a big penalty. Well, Obviously they felt like it was significant. And it's closed because as you pointed out, the jet dryers are working on pit road. There are crew members trying to drive pit road right there. I mean, it's clearly closed with the red lights. That's a shocking. I was just saying how I get nervous about things not running, and then the 22 pits, that's going to keep me up at couple, night for a couple more weeks. I mean, that's just an awful turn of events. So it was a piece of debris, Steve, in the throttle body. That's what had happened. I don't know how they found it or diagnosed it, but they were worried it would get lodged in there and possibly cause a hung throttle. Certainly not what you want here at New Hampshire. And uh, now there's some emergency to get them off of pit road. Are they actually going to hold them here and make them serve their penalty now? So, Marty, why two laps? Did NASCAR say why two? I, I don't know. That was T.J. Major saying that over the radio. I'm going to try and get some uh, verification on that. But you can see them serving at least the one lap right here. So take a look at this replay here. Let's watch the lower right. That piece of rubber on the ground. Oh, right here. I know you guys oh, have been waiting big, to see my improvements. That, whatever that is, man, that was a big piece of that's crazy. Debris or something maybe that came in there, maybe during that accident down in turn one. It was a big enough issue for Joey Logano. He felt that, and they were concerned, even under caution, it could hang the throttle. Sure. That's the only reason you would serve this penalty, knowing you were going to come down and serve a two-lap penalty. I'm assuming, Steve, that the two-lap penalty, because of the trucks on the pit road, the safety hazard of having trucks on pit road, yeah, so that line. is a huge penalty. They had a major concern for, for Joey's safety. Well, I guess if, if you're in Joey's situation, you're going to you know, hope that there's those opportunities early in this race to possibly you know, get those laps back before the field starts to lap cars and That's put right. multiple cars one lap down. Then he's trapped by himself two laps down and will not be able to get that wave around. Yeah, because currently he'd be the only car lap down or even multiple laps down. So a quick yellow, he'd, he'd be getting his laps back right away. So already in this race, we're only 11 laps in, three of the favorites with major issues. Joey Logano now two laps down along with Truex in the race, in the wreck, Kyle Busch in the wreck. Pit road closed. No opportunity for, for Truex's guys to actually get down pit road and do more additional work on that car. Okay, Paul Harvey has showed up on the scene with the rest of the story. It's not coming down a closed pit road. That is the trouble for the 22 of Joe Logano. We are sitting under a red flag. Look at the crew member. Open the hood flap and then reach in. Ah, no dice. Can't work on a car under red flag conditions. NASCAR saw that and due to that, you see the other crew members coming out, but they have covers, they have some other things. This right here is clearly more than covering the car, Marty. So that is the reason they have been held for two laps. Yep, yeah, that is the two lap penalty. I'm standing here with Paul Wolf and he's shaking his head. Yes, that's what happened. So he's talking to Joey right now. What exactly was it, Paul? Yeah, it was unfortunate. A piece of debris or something flew up off of the racetrack and got up in the linkage there. And uh, when we went green there initially, just uh, wasn't getting wide open. So uh, we just had to fix it. I feel like our car's auto trader Ford was fast, but we're going to need to get wide open throttle to be able to win this race. There you go. And obviously now down two laps, they've got their work cut out for them, Steve. I, I don't know how they would make that up, but the, putting all that puzzle together, we appreciate Paul Wolf's time there. What a crazy start to this race today at New Hampshire. Yeah, first of all, I agree with Marty. 
Uh, really appreciate Paul Wolf. I'm not sure I would have been in such a state of mind where I could have gave such a good interview. Um, could get wide open. Jeff, I assume they saw that in the data. Like, hey, man, why aren't you going to wide open? What's the deal, right? They had that whole red flag, or maybe they saw it live. Um, so an unfortunate situation, but you called it. Two laps down, what Joey Logano needs now, Junior, is a quick yellow. He wants a green, yep. a couple laps, a yellow, because the wave of around, you know, free pass is not just the, the guy one lap, it's whoever is the closest car yeah. to the lead lap cars. You can even be two laps down if you're the only guy. Yeah, so no, as long as nobody goes a lap down, then he gets that pa he gets that free pass. But, uh, you know, he's going to have to hope Truex has some good pace in that car, and they're able to repair it, and a few of the other guys to back the field can continue pace. And he gets that early yellow, something, something you know, brings out that yellow. I'm, I'm curious, though, Steve. You know you can't work on the car on the red flag. And you know there's a caution. You know you're going to come down pit road and work on the car without penalty. So was the decision they maybe they don't see us? Like, you know what I mean? Like, to me, that was a mistake. That was an unforced error in a bad situation. You could have come down pit road and not served any penalty other than starting at the back of the line. But working on the car on the red flag, they're going to penalize you. Well, what we don't know, was that a crew member who thought he was in the right? Was it direction from the team already? You know, those... Those bits of information never, ever seem to come out. But I do agree with Jeff. It was an uh, unforced error. Well, Steve, we talk about 10-cent parts all the time. Let me show you the debris. That's all the debris was. It was in the throttle body. And obviously, Joey could not go full throttle with that debris, just that little piece. And it's like a piece of rubber that's come off of a tire, maybe. And that's the debris that caused Joey Logano to lose those two laps. Man, it's been an intense day. And I know it's felt pretty intense up here in the booth. Kyle Petty, Del Jarrett down in the pits. What's the mood down there? Well, I'd have to say this might be the strangest uh, 10, 12 laps of the start of a race <laughs> that I've ever seen and been a part of with all the crazy things that have been happening here. Uh, but as from a driver's perspective, I think the biggest thing, getting your mindset back right to go racing again on this racetrack, trusting in the fact they've got it dry now and, and seeing what your car can do. Yeah, trusting in the fact that the racetrack's dry. Now, we know the tires have a few laps on them. We heard William Byron talk about air pressure and all this stuff. All, everything's been washed off again, so it's a green racetrack. How tentative are these guys, or yeah. how aggressive? Because you're going to have both ends of the spectrum. Some of these guys are going to make it up in this first turn as soon as we go back green. Some of them are going to slag back a little bit. Uh, it's crazy to think we've lost two cars. We've had a car penalized two laps. The only thing working right now is the coffee maker over in the truck that we're going in. <laughs> that seems to be the only thing normal this week. Yeah, we're going to need that. But, you know, you were talking about Joey Logano and needing a quick caution. I was always very hesitant as a driver, knowing that a caution would help me out because I either was the caution or I ended up in somebody else's caution. Yeah. And uh, we were in worse shape than we were. So we'll see what happens here. But I expect things to be a little bit on the calm side as we start back. Yeah. I Junior, I'm going to throw it back up to you, and I hope you guys are a lot calmer during this race than y'all were during that rain delay right there because it was getting a little out of control. <laughs> oh, man, I have a lot of fun with the rain field. But uh, let's take a look at how we got here. It's been, been, been quite a while, so if you're just tuning in. Got the race started. Kyle Busch jumped out to an early lead over Martin Trix Jr. Just eight laps into the race. We had weather on the racetrack down in turn one and two. Too much rain. Slick track, Kyle Busch in the wall, multiple cars out of control. Heavy damage to both the 18 and the 19. The 19 made some repairs to their car, the 11, and then he handled it with a little bit of damage, goes around. This is on board with Truex. Watch him work the steering wheel, just no grip, there's nothing to do. Unfortunately, the 19 is able to work on their car. Still some heavy damage, but still on the racetrack. The 18, on the other hand, though, heavy damage. Kyle Busch. Not happy with NASCAR, showing his displeasure at the expense of the pace car. Then they just do not have enough to be able to do to this car, so they had to load it up going home. And then under red flag, Joey Logano wasn't able to get wide open. The crew member goes in, going to try to fix it, but you can't work on the car in the red flag. Two lap penalty. So Joey Logano starting this race two laps down. Well, now the competition caution is finally official. The pit road will be open this time. I don't think we expect to see anybody pit towards the front of the field. Cars cruising through turns three and four. So approaching the entrance to pit road. We've run six green flag laps, and I'm, <laughs> I can't imagine we've ever in a race has it been this confusing in six laps. I mean, it's so much happened already. 
far. Nobody taking the turn down the pit road. Pit road still closed, actually, guys. They did not open pit road that time by. Ooh. And I think it's because down here in turn one and two, we still have some trucks on the racetrack that are drying the weepers that have been a problem all morning long. Down here in turn one and two, they've been grinding into this racetrack, cutting holes, drilling holes, trying to relieve the pressure in the water underneath the surface right there. It's still continuing to give us problems. And we see that they'll, I've seen this before, they get this fixed, then they put cars on the track, the pressure of those cars pushing down on the track around those weepers pushes that water up out of the surface and they continue uh, to, to bring moisture up onto the surface of the racetrack. So hopefully they'll get that remedied up. We'll be able to open pit road. Well, with all that excitement, Chase Elliott leads. Kurt Busch second, Bowman third, Bell fourth, Blaney fifth, Kozlowski, Reddit, Larson, Harvick, and Matty Deeds, the top 10. Looking at the radar, luckily there's no more threat of rain and uh, just the threat of darkness is what most of these teams are worried about. And I know NASCAR, every lap they run under caution, that delays the end of this race a few more minutes later into the day. So that, you, this is already a difficult race to call as a crew chief strategy-wise, Steve. Now you've got to throw in the idea or potential that you may be not running all 301 laps today. So, you know, NASCAR is going to officiate it and let the teams know if they can't run it all, can run it all. I'm already hitting my engineer. Hey, man, you, Google when sunset is. I need to know when that is. Let's put that little clock on the on the pit box because, you know, they can't change the world. They can right. run this race as hard as they want to run it, and then we try to get as many laps as we want. But with no lights here, darkness is darkness. So as we run here, barring the cautions, barring how this race runs, I'm making sure my engineer is staying ahead. So I'm going to call a race to the sunset, even if NASCAR hasn't told me yet, because I mean, you can't run in the dark. So once you get inside of the window to make it to the finish of a 301 lap complete race you're coming to pit road asap as next yellow i'm on pit road for sure and to your point i may start guessing if it's not 301 right if it right. turns into a 280 or a 260 i'm going to try to uh, be the first guy to figure that out be the, be the first guy to figure <laughs> yeah. that out yeah. Oh you were you were quite the gambler that final season so i, I think you'd probably guess pretty good you know you have i mean it's uh all that technology is available with all of them. They have, you just have to take advantage of everything you can find. In the wreck. So they're coming down pit road, got to start in the back anyway. So we're going, trying to get work done, see parts and pieces flying off the car. But they got to be careful. We have not restarted, so that damaged vehicle clock, clock continues to run. It was at 350 earlier. It takes 30 seconds or so to run pit road, plus as long as you're sitting in your pit box. It does a pretty good work to get that thing raceable on the racetrack and I think the biggest question for for them and performance wise uh, the performance of the car is probably that left front splitter and the damage to it and how that's going to affect the handling of the car it's really critical at this racetrack as flat as this place is that, that splitter works properly gives you the advantage and downforce you want but also isn't so low it's all over the racetrack taking away front grip yeah we're here and he's looking around a minute left on his clock so I'm not very close I don't know if I would come back down pit road Let's listen to Tyler Reddick's radio. What are these guys talking about? Well, I'm officially cold, like freezing. It's uh, chilly in here. It's always something. Either too hot, too cold. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I don't think you can. <laughs> I, I don't, have I ever, I'm not sure I've ever said that before. Too cold in here. <laughs> Just give it a minute. Just give it a minute. It's about to warm up. See the temperature. It has been chilly. I mean, 67 degrees. I looked at my phone this morning and it's 62 degrees and walked outside and it was going to stay under 70. I was pretty surprised at those temperatures here this time of year, but uh, humidity is really high. Marty, what you got? Let's chat with Adam Stevens. Christopher Bell sits in four. So this is an interesting start to the race, isn't it? So how do you play this comp caution? Do you think many of the front runners will come down, Adam, or not? I think we're close enough to the front that we'd be a fool to give up our track position. You know, we only have a couple of laps on the tires. We're damage free. We didn't lock tires up. Um, really no motivation to pit here, but a lot of guys in the back have no reason not to, so they can come get some tires and some fuel and see if they can make their way forward. So what advice do you give Christopher on this restart? Because obviously with how things were, the track seems to be ready and fine, but there's still weepers down there in one and two. You just got to be careful. You know, he's done a really good job so far of keeping us out of trouble and just staying under it. You know, you think you have a little margin, but if it gets wet, that margin gets gone in a hurry. 
you go. And Christopher sits in four, so don't expect the 20 car on pit road during this comp caution. All right, so I can confirm green light on pit road now. And what Adam Stevens said makes perfect sense, right? So Bell in fourth isn't going to pit, but who will? Newman in 20th? Eric Jones, 21st, maybe Stenhouse, 22nd. If you look even farther back, though, how about Bubba Wallace had to start at the back? He's up to 27th. Fresh tires could help a car all the way back there. We'll see if anybody pits from the back of the field. I feel like Denny Hamlin's going to come down pit road involved in that issue, and he brings everybody behind him. That's always something that happens. You get one guy coming down pit road, and everybody follows him. Marty. You see the 11, Denny Hamlin coming down pit road, and as you guys mentioned, pretty much everybody behind him, including the car that he owns, Bubba Wallace. So some four fresh Goodyear tires here for Denny Hamlin. And again, remember, they were part of the cars that spun on that incident very early on in the race, but no damage for the 11 car, unlike his teammates, Kyle Busch and Martin Truex Jr. Finishing up their pit stops, and getting back onto the racetrack. Mark Strix Jr. and his team trying to make final adjustments to the damage on this car. So impressive what these teams can do. To, Come on. So impressive what these teams can do to get these cars repaired. Using a lot of that clock. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really not a lot of time to make those kind of repairs. He's going to finish with a few seconds left. He's got to get off pit road, though. So what the crew chief does is he logs on to a website. NASCAR provides the competitors, and he has this same clock on top of the pit box. That's how he can cut it so close. Now, five seconds? That's ah, too close. That's a little too close for me. <laughs> Maybe nervous. But hey, you know, take advantage of all this time you have. And, uh, you know, right there, James Small doing a nice job of managing it all. But that's why he knows with some confidence what the time situation is. I'm impressed by the, the quality of repair. I think that that, to me, is something teams spend a lot more time on. Uh, and usually, you know, they're, you come down pit road with that kind of damage and you're cutting everything off. Uh, and now you guys can almost repair the car perfectly. And even beyond that, knowing when they had to send him off pit road to be able to meet that time before he got right here to leave yeah. his pit box. And James Smalls knew if he runs his pit road speed, it's going to take him this many seconds to get to the end of pit road. He got him there, five seconds to spare. That's using every second you've got. Now, a little risky, a little gamble. What if Martin Truex would have stumbled the car leaving the pit box? Little problem, their day would be over. So pushing all the limit, but gambling at the same time. And NASCAR is asking the drivers thumbs up or thumbs down for track conditions. It looks like a flag man's preparing to give the field one to go. Well, we'll give a little choose right here. It'll be our first choose of the day. Yeah, this is the first time that the Cup Series has used the choose rule at this racetrack. This was implemented last year after the race here in New Hampshire. Last year's race, the lead control car, typically the, the top lane was popular. But yesterday in the Xfinity race, Jeff, me and you both saw both lanes be an advantage for whoever controlled the restart. So I think it matters who's behind you. Whether where the teammates you have are at, where they're lining up at, but typically I think we're going to see that that lead car pick the top. And Chase Elliott, he's on the inside with Kurt Busch on the outside. I think the bottom of the racetrack on low air pressure without that traction compound up in the third lane appears to be where you want to go because it seems like that less banking in the corner you would think is a disadvantage, but it's heating those tires up quicker. It's working those tires. And you just want to drive as much heat into your car as you can at this racetrack. It's one of the most difficult racetracks to get restarted on. No grip whatsoever when they enter turn 37 one. car, Ryan Priest has to go to the back of the field. Too fast, exiting pit road. The field comes to the restart. Guy goes on for the restart of this race, lap 23 of stage one. And we're back underway. Ross Chastain, three wide, entered turn one on the apron. Sure did. I've never seen that before. It's going to work out for him, though, down the back straightaway. Kurt Busch takes the lead away. Chase Elliott working the bottom of the racetrack here, trying to get up on the inside of this number one car off turn four. How about Kurt Busch, last week's winner, lead early today. Never count that guy out. Look at Christopher Mason Bell. Elliott all over the back of him. Yeah. Christopher Bell, man, he, he 
loves this racetrack. Seems to be a great match for him. He's worked his way up into the top five. Going after Chase Elliott right on the bottom. Mr. Mabel in Xfinity race yesterday used that same move. Look at Chase Elliott trying to keep Christopher Bell from advancing on him. Yesterday, I thought it was Christopher's car that was so good that was allowing him to roll that bottom of three and four, but it's something that Christopher knows and utilizes at this racetrack. He can wrap the bottom against that apron so well. Patience in the throttle. I was just going to mention, as we watch this battle right here, now for the lead, the 19 of Martin Truex Jr., all that talk about the clock. He met minimum speed, so he's all set. Take as much time as he needs under the next yellow to continue repairs. The thing about this racetrack, you can make up a lot of time on corner entry. Christopher Bell that time did not do it, but down in turn three, really drove deep into the corner. Let's see if he does it this time. Chase had a great one and two, put a big gap on him. Look at Ryan Blaney, drive that car way in the corner. Doesn't even try to stay on the bottom, just slides right up in front of Kurt. Kurt having a little bit of trouble here as he's starting to fade back through the field. Brad Keselowski on the inside of this 48. It's going to allow Reddick to get to the outside of his car. Great little battle between these guys. Reddick doing a little bit of a crossover. Now underneath the two car, Brad Keselowski down the back straightaway. Good looking race car Brad's got. Brad now trying the crossover move on Reddick to the inside of the eight car down the front stretch. What a racetrack, man. This place is so much fun for drivers. Now Reddick, will he try it again? Not going to cross over. He's going to stay on the outside, try to push this 48 car down the back straightaway, maintain the outside on the two car. Brad Kozlowski in the three. Brad's going to dive down in there. We saw. Blaney do the same thing. Now Brad needs to wash up in front of the 48, take his line away. He's going to do that. Right behind them, Ross Chastain. The five car of Kyle Larson have been battling. Talked about three wide Chastain at the start of this race. Look at him drive underneath Matt DiBenedetto. Goes all the way to the apron on the racetrack. It's something, see the water fly up when he transitioned back onto the racetrack? The aproning you can use here. See it a lot on restarts. Yeah, there's no out of bounds at this racetrack. Chastain working hard, trying to stay on the outside of Kyle Larson. Sends that car hard into the center of turns one and two. Great momentum off the corner here. Good pace, a little bit of a bobble off the corner. A little bit of damage on that left rear of the 42. I don't think anything will hurt him. Yeah, that happened in that issue we had with the rain in turn one and two. Larson just can't quite get clear of Chastain. Got a little more pace and a better, better speed through the corner, but Chastain can hang on that outside and frustrate Kyle lap after lap here. Caution's out on the racetrack. We've got a car spun out on the front straightaway exiting turn four. 38 car, Anthony Alfredo got turned around. You see damage to the right front, the left or the right rear as well. Big break for Joey Logano. We talked about how do you get back in this race if you're the 22 car. Well, unfortunate for Anthony Alfredo. You mentioned it, Junior, big damage, but that will be one of his two passes back for the driver of the 22. Yeah, if you're two laps down, it's got to get to one. So right? frustrating trying to get those laps back, but this is going to work out perfectly. And you see Anthony getting loose up underneath Bubba Wallace. Spins himself out. Running 25th when this happened. On board the 19 car. Bubba's trying to do a traditional exit where you enter the corner high and kind of come off a little bit lower and straighter. And Anthony makes contact, spins himself out there. And Bubba Wallace after that came down pit road must have cut the left rear tire on that 23 car. Yeah. It is cut. You can see how the car's sitting on the racetrack. So he was fortunate that in that contact, Alfredo actually spun. If Alfredo hadn't spun, he would have had that flat tire under green conditions. And to turn one, that would have been tough. Would have felt like rain on the racetrack. 
it would have been the same result. The same sure. result? Hey, man, too yeah. soon. Too, too soon. soon. Oh, sorry. Sorry. NASCAR Drive is your live race day companion. Follow your favorite driver with high-definition in-car cameras or select an alternate camera angle to see more action. Select up to eight different cameras or watch four at a time with a multi-camera multi view. Visit nascar.com slash drive or download the NASCAR mobile app today. Let's go back and watch this great battle for Brad Keselowski, Tyler Reddick. Tyler Reddick running that outside line. What that allows him to do right there allows him to turn left. Keselowski having trouble getting off the corner because he's got the car pinched off trying to turn. That's an advantage to Reddick. So Keselowski says, hey, you know what? I watched what you did. So he runs the car up the racetrack. Now he turns left knowing Tyler Reddick's going to have the same problem on corner exit and goes and takes the spot back. Great fun racing by those two guys. Now the stress of New Hampshire kind of starts on pit road because nine laps on that run right there, 42 laps to go in the stage. I was kind of watching some of the cars that pitted, Briscoe, was the last car on old tires, but Eric Jones, McDowell, Hamlin, they were making good moves through the field. Or I say good, but they had passed six or seven cars in eight laps. That's pretty good in my opinion. So uh, we'll see if anybody decides to pit and if the guys that have pit decide to stay out. Yeah, I'll be surprised if anybody in the front, you know, half of the front top five or so gives up that track position. But if one of them does come, does it peel the rest of the field down pit road, similar to what we saw with Denny Hamlin when he brought half those guys in. One of the toughest things about calling this race, Junior, to be quite honest, is to try to understand what everyone around you has. Yeah. Because you're like, well, is, is that guy fast or is he on new tires? I mean, there's so many different strategies, Marty. It's hard to just keep them all straight from pit road. You see Bubba Wallace on there on pit road trying to clearance the left rear. William Byron, meanwhile, says he ran over something on the racetrack. I don't see any damage on the front, but he said, I think I might have a flat potentially. Rudy Fugel said, hey, just feel it out for a little while. I think it, you should be okay. Everything to them looks up in terms of the tires, but William certainly concerned that he hit some debris on the track. I think the reason pit road may not be open yet, guys, there's a, a lot of concern about one and two, especially below that line on the bottom of the racetrack as here comes pit road, and now it's fine the open. Dylan? And a couple of Hendrick cars in. There's Alex Bowman who pits from inside the top 10. His report, car just a little bit tight. He needs to point better to get off the corner. Going to make a couple big adjustments. Air pressure, tape, and track bar on the 48. Marty. Kyle Larson's been pretty happy with his car, Dylan. He's pitting the other Hendrick car coming down pit road here. Four fresh Goodyear tires for Kyle Larson. William Byron also going to take advantage of this caution just to make sure that if he did indeed hit some debris, those four fresh Goodyear tires should take care of it. All the crew chiefs telling the drivers, be careful on pit road exit. It is a little damp below the line. Now we've got multiple cars, multiple strategies, three or four different strategies going on throughout the field. The green flag coming up after this.
NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by Credit One Bank, the official credit card of NASCAR. Visit GoCreditOne.com and by Toyota. Aero coverage brought to you today by GEICO. So many fans here at New Hampshire, a lot of camping. This is such a great racetrack for fans to come see. Concerts going on on Saturday night. Kind of a carnival atmosphere. Steve, you know this place pretty well, a lot of fun. Oh, I love it up here. Been coming for years, even before I ever was part of the sport. As a little kid up in New England, this was it. When, and I'm telling you, when the Cup Series came here, this was the mecca of motorsports for New England. It continues. Fields coming off the of turn four, getting ready for another restart. Chase Elliott and Christopher Bell bring him to the start finish line. Brian Blaney pushing his friend Chase Elliott down into turn one. Look at Christopher Bell though. Wow, he's going to clear, almost clear the nine car down the back straightaway. Chase Elliott making a rebound here. We got a oh. spin. Off turn two, the 51 car. It's Cody Ware. Still a battle for the still lead green. right here. Still green. Got a hustle. Stay under Got green off turn four. So Chase Elliott using that third lane to clear Christopher Bell. Bell and Blaney both still running the bottom of the racetrack. Right behind these guys, you got Brad Keselowski, Kurt Busch, Kevin Harvick working his way through the field in that four car. Has struggled all year to deliver the results that we're used to seeing from this team. Looking great out of the gate here early in New Hampshire. Down into turn one. Big, big racing back here. Three wide. Well, these are the guys that decided to come to Pitt Road, William Byron. Bowman, Larson, all with fresh tires and looking for real estate. It's the most dangerous part of the race if you went back there to get tires. You're in the middle of this chaos. Do not need to get damaged right now. Could mess your entire day up. Battle for second on top. Brian Blaney takes that away from Christopher Bell. Christopher looking really good on that restart, but starting to fade back here into third position. Goodness. Fortunately, Larson knew he was three wide, didn't move up the racetrack and get into the side of Amarola. You mentioned a spin, but we stayed green right here. 51 of Cody Ware just gets loose. That's off turn two, looking up the back straightaway, spins around, but no contact. Nice job right here, straight the car right back up. Kept underway. Matt De Benedetto getting around Kurt Busch for seventh spot. Looks like that one struggling, Dylan. They are, Junior. Kurt Busch just reporting on that last run that he is just loose everywhere. So falling back here, you see him under fire from his teammate. Something else that they're battling, though, is the radio. So every time Kurt presses the button inside the cockpit, it sticks for a little bit. It'll eventually kind of sort itself out, and the crew can talk to him. But while the button is stuck, he has no communication with the pit box because nobody can talk because the button's hung up. So kind of a product maybe of the weather and the rain that maybe got inside the electronics, something that we a lot of times see when it rains at racetracks like this. But just another hurdle for this one team to overcome today, Marty. A little further forward, Matt De Benedetto sitting in the seventh position at one of his better racetracks. He's finished top six in the last two races here. Talk to Matty D. Obviously, the tough news this week that he will officially not be back with the Wood Brothers. And Jonathan Hassler, his crew chief, talked to him before the race and said, listen, I know you need to go feel like you have to prove things to the garage area. You want another ride? Just don't try too hard. I know you put a lot of effort in. Give it your best. Don't over try trying to get another gig. Certainly a good point by the young crew chief Hassler to Matt Benedetto trying to get a job for next year. Marty, that is a great point. Everybody works so hard in this sport to be able to be successful and move forward. You can try too hard and make things worse. Get yourself in bad situations. Got to temper that. Great advice from a young crew chief. The battle back here in the pack between these cars on tires and trying to work their way through the field. Getting around slower cars is 
fascinating. Ricky Stenhouse right here in front, in front of the 22 car of Logano. Looking at Truex getting around him in that 19 car. And it stayed consistent here. You mentioned the tires, the top 11 are all the drivers that have yet to pit. Everyone who has stayed on the racetrack has stayed in the top 11. So coming to pit road and getting fresh tires has put you back in this mess. And with 29 to go, they still haven't overcome really anybody who decided to stay on the racetrack. Yeah, look at the Truex fans. They gotta be happy with the pace of that car. It closes in on the 17 car, Chris Buescher. Hey, I'm surprised Truex's car is as good as it is. Left front splitter is completely gone. He won't quit, he'll fight all day. Right in front of them, six car Ryan Newman. Ryan Newman maybe looking for somewhere to go next year. Maybe not done racing in this series. Here's the battle for third. Brad Kozlowski, Christopher Bell. Brad trying to take it away. Christopher trying to stop that from happening. That two car kind of looks like the Tron car. Marty, what you got on this two? Pretty cool looking car, isn't it, for Brad Keselowski this weekend? You know, Steve, we had that debate last week in Atlanta when Brad told me before that race, hey, New Hampshire must win for us. I asked him again this morning, New Hampshire still a must win as he gets the third spot there from Christopher Bell, maybe. And he said, yes, it still is. He said, listen, what I meant was, if we're going to have a shot at Phoenix, we need to run well today. We need to show this 750 package, this tire, the same exact one we'll use to run for a championship. We need to run well in that and prove it to everybody else, too, but mostly ourselves to show that we can do it. That's what he meant by that. Obviously, they did it last year, and they were in that championship for and arguably had the fastest car in the championship race as well. Yeah, Marty, you know, I would say with some good pit stops, that two car, because Lowski could have won that race at Phoenix last year, won a championship, led the most laps here, won this race last year. You know that he wants to repeat that. Another car that has a, another drive that has a great car today is Denny Hamlin in the 11. He was in that accident in the rain in turn one, came in, made some slight repairs, pitted at lap 20 for some fresh tires, and now he's driven all the way up into the 10th position. He's the first guy, Junior, to pass some of those cars that have stayed out. Austin Dillon in the three, Custer in the 41 right behind him. They are still on the original tires of the race, so he's a little bit of a tire advantage, but the car just looks like it's handling pretty well. This is your Toyota driver update. Denny Hamlin, 10th right now. He started in sixth, has fifth. Pitted on the, the early laps of the race to get down pit road and get off sequence. Worked his way back through, and that's no surprise, man. We see this guy run up front at this racetrack. It's almost an automatic when you come here that you're going to see Denny Hamlin either winning the race or in the in the picture when they cross the finish line. The question, what, what is it about Denny Hamlin that makes him so good at Richmond, Martinsville, Loudoun, Phoenix, the short tracks? I think he's a short track, you know, his, his roots. His, his roots are from the short tracks, uh, the late mile stock race tracks from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia. So when he comes to a place like this, he feels at home. He knows how to get around it. The other thing I think that makes Denny Hamlin so good is he's able to repeat lap after lap. He's a precise driver. If he can do, if you do it once, he can do it 100 times. And he can hit those marks and get off the gas exactly at the right time. Rhythm matters at these racetracks. That's what he's so good at. 300 cars are still trying to get their way back up through the field. Almost working together and yeah, working their way toward the toward the top 10. Bowman in 13th and Byron getting around Eric Jones in that familiar 43 car. Look at Larson. It's so fun to see a driver just attack the corner, drive way deep in the corner. Roll the bottom. Let's see if he does it to his teammate. These guys have kind of been in this order since they came off pit road. Now with a little bit of clear traffic to be able to race with each other instead of other cars are trying to get around. Let's see who has the better car. Kevin Harvick, man, he has run some really quick laps. Got around Tyler Reddick. It's closed in on Christopher Bell. This has to create some excitement on top of that pit box. Rodney Childers, Kevin Harvick, we're used to seeing them win races right up front. You know that Rodney Childers is loving what he's seeing right now.
We got a great battle for the lead brewing here between two great friends. Chase Elliott. But Ryan Blaney wants to take that away from him. Down into turn one, Blaney's been closing in. The lap traffic's been creating some opportunities for Blaney. Blaney's strength has been on corner exit, been able to beat Chase Elliott, leaving the corner this time. He's able to turn underneath him. Let's see what he can do on corner entry. Front brake road is glowing red. Washes up the racetrack, couldn't keep it on the bottom, but right here is where Blaney's car has been good. But having to pinch the car off in the middle hurt the exit that time. Got to sit back there and try, try to regroup, rebound. Close back in on Chase. Oh, Chase with a big moment right there in the corner back, steps out from him. We saw that earlier on corner entry from the nine car. Slipping that right rear in the middle of one and two. Now his teammate has a little more position on him. He's just going to take that lead away. I think Chase says, all right, man, I need to I need to calm down here and get back in the rhythm. Ryan Blaney, your new leader. We saw this some yesterday where tires would kind of get overheated. You had to just calm down and cool them off or we'd continue to lose time. Let's take another look at this move right here. Blaney underneath the nine. That glow of the brake rotor, pretty common when a driver especially is trying to push hard and pass another car for the lead or another car for position. Running behind that car, you have a little less air getting into those ducts. You're pushing hard as you can. See Chase get loose. And then behind them, go back live, see Kevin Harvick trying to take third place from Christopher Bell. Why is it hard on the bottom of the racetrack? There's just less banking down there. There's less grip. Car just does not stick the way it does in that second or even third groove. Harvick using that bottom, just left sides on that white line, hoping to, hoping to use Alfredo as a pick right here. And he's gonna hope to catch that 38 car and be able to, up the 20 is gonna be able to clear. Now he's able to get around the 38 of Anthony Alfredo, but this has brought Reddick into the battle here. Reddick showing some great pace here early in the eight car for Richard Childish Racing. Reddick talks about how he's had to work really hard to learn how to get around this racetrack. It's pretty technical and difficult. And he spent a lot of time trying to understand how guys like Kevin Harvick and Denny Hamlin have so much speed and pace here. Looks like it's paid off. Oh, loose right there. You saw the back of that eight car step around. See, it's still wiggling. Typically what you fight here is a very tight car in the center of the corner. So you see those guys using that apron, turning down low off the corner, under that line to try to de-wedge the car, put the left front on that flatter banking, and it helps the car turn. Sometimes though it can shear or slip the right rear tire and get loose. So you see what Harvick's done, he's changed his approach. He's now running high, entering the corner. Of course, now underneath Bell, he's got to run that low entrance, but not all the way to the line like we saw him before. Use a more racetrack, hoping now he can turn. And that allows him not to turn the wheel as much right here. Keep both rear tires equally planted so it doesn't spin the rear tires. This is where his weak point has been. That time he just overdrives the entry. Able to still keep it on the bottom. Oh. I think Chris, he showed Christopher <laughs> Bell the bumper a little bit on the on the front straightaway to lap four. Christopher says here, you can have the spot, Mr. Harvick. Here comes Reddick <laughs> taking advantage of it. Reddick's going to try to get two for one here. I don't think it's going to work, though. Harvick's going to get a great run here. Christopher Bell back to the outside of the eight car down the back straightaway. Reddick's in a difficult position because he's, as he moves forward and can clear the 20, he's up under the four car then and can't finish the corner. And you see what it caused. Oh, Harvick trying to negotiate a lap car there. Reddick trying to stay the inside of Christopher Bell. Fighting hard, low on the racetrack. I get so nervous when we watch guys drive into the corner on the inside of each other that that, un that car on the bottom is going to get loose up into the door of the car on the outside. We see that time and time again here as you talk about the grip level on the bottom of the racetrack. It's a Reddick right there. Let's see what he's able to do. 
He went up the racetrack some, he didn't try to wrap the white line. It's kind of just to say to Bell, hey, look, man, this is my track. I'm gonna run you up there if you're in my way. Here comes Kozlowski trying to advance on Elliott. Yeah, Brad's got great pace, same as last year. A race-winning car. We haven't seen good speed from Brad in quite a while since he's been sort of negotiating his future. And what that means for him, I think it's taken a focus away from their performance. And he's at a track where he dominated last year, run really well, and won the race. Seems like the team's back on track again today. Elliott clearly has some work to do on his race car. Not yeah. bad, but not winning speed right now. Between the cycles, track changing as well, as well as all these laps on the tires. See the 53 car Garrett Smithley getting well out of the way of these two as they battle for second. Brad still working that bottom. Still trying to hassle this nine car up off the corner here. Getting his mirror a little bit down the straightaway. Gonna go in the corner with him. Try to upset the arrow on the back of that nine up the track. The nine slips a little bit. That's gonna give Brad a position here on corner exit. Not quite able to clear. So you saw him sort of go in the corner on the back bumper on the left quarter panel of the nine. It sent the nine just up over that, that last seam. And Brad really had the spot, could have taken it away. Finally, in three and four, he completes the pass right out in front of these guys. Blaney's out to a 1.8 second lead. All that work there helps Blaney out a little bit as we close in on the end of this stage. Blaney's going to come around and get the white flag. BJ McLeod in the 78 does a nice job. It's a hard track to stay out of the way. I mean, the line's so wide, these leaders could not go anywhere. Ryan Blaney right here, down into turn one on the final lap of stage one. Great pace from this Hins Pinsky car. Him and Brad Keselowski both out in control of this field. This would be good momentum for Blaney. If he can win this stage and maybe continue to have a successful day. Exits turn four, all clean. No lap traffic ahead, and Ryan Blaney will claim stage one. Blaney's fourth stage win in 2021. You mentioned it, Hensky teammates one and two in this stage. Joey Logano still a lap down from that earlier penalty. Bell, Hamlin, Chastain, Matty D, Larson, top ten. Larson restarted 19th on those tires. Took him that entire time to get all the way back to 10th. There's the lobster everybody's trying to win today. Not for these guys, they got in trouble early, but a lot of racing left, a lot of great action here in New Hampshire. We'll be back.
Welcome back, NASCAR Cup Series action. Fox Woods Resort Casino 301. Pit stops up, coming up. So let's get down to Marty Snyder in the pits. Hey, I just want to make a real quick point. Kyle Busch had the number one pit stall today. There you see it on the right-hand side of your screen. Well, they're out of the race. Look who has the number two pit stall, Brad Keselowski. What an advantage that is, Steve. They will have, in essence, the number one pit stall for the rest of the day. They'll be able to shoot straight out of their pits, Dylan. And the first pit stall at the head of pit road is the nine car, Chase Elliott. A little bit loose is his report, but doesn't want to change too much. Car's pretty good. They make a track bar just you see there. Add some tape to the grill, four Goodyear tires, and Sunoco fuel as well for our defending champion. Ryan Blaney in as well, said he was a little bit tight, wanted to roll the center there in the center of your screen. And Kevin Harvick just said he needs more rear grip, as you saw him struggle to get out of his box there, Marty. See if Kowalski can take advantage of what they have inherited as the number one pit stall now. He said the car just way too free for much of that run for him, and he slides. He's actually going to lose spots in that transaction. They made a fairly big adjustment, said he was way too free for much of that run, needed the left rear in the track a lot more. Race off pit road. Brought to you by PNC Bank. Hamlin plus five. Blaney, you see it right there. Christopher Bell. How long has it been since we said Harvick? Yeah. First car off pit road. That's crazy. Picked up three spots. Well, let's check in with Kyle Petty and Dale Jarrett. See what's going on, guys. <laughs> Listen, I don't, I don't know who. Listen, we talked about how crazy this race was when it started. Who figured or who had in their fantasy league three Fords in the top five at the end of stage one? The Fords have shown up here. I, I mean, it's been fascinating to watch how well they work in the corner through the center of the corner and can get position. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see with your adjustments made as this racetrack continues to cool off as the temperature goes down out here, what's going to happen uh, with all of that? So I think we saw some drivers that are needing some really yeah. good runs to step up here this afternoon and, and really do the job in that first stage. The other thing, Cal, fascinating to watch drivers, especially the veteran drivers, work and work and work to make a pass. We saw Brad work so yes. hard there just to get that second spot. If you're a young guy watching racing, you're watching guys set up each other. And, and, and that, that's the amazing part. Watching Brad, he set up the nine car. He took advantage of it. He tried, he tried. He figured out where the weakness was and, and was able to do it. I, I know we're getting ready to go green, but who would have figured that we could mount a camera on top of Mount Washington in the northern part of New Hampshire <laughs> and catch us on the back of this truck? I mean, I, I would have never believed that either. Yeah, we've been a little bit everywhere yes, here, but have. it's really fun <laughs> racing and to watch this. And I think the, the intensity is only going to ramp up as these drivers really don't know how long yeah. they may go here this afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah. Well, Kevin Harvick leads the field down the front straightaway. He's got to thank his pit crew for that great pit stop work. Those are the first laps he's led since Darlington back in May. So, and he's got great pace in this race car today. We've seen him drive up through the field. I mean, I didn't see him coming out here and beating Denny Hamlin and the rest of these guys to win this race, but he very well could do it. You and I had a conversation about fantasy teams. How's he going to run? I had him in the top 10, you know, 6th, 7th, 8th. I, I just didn't see this out of the four doing a nice job. You see stage one points. Blaney with 10. Larson got in with one, so that can help your fantasy team. And, you know, Kyle Petty picks on being everywhere on the racetrack. I can assure you of one thing. Another, Red, yeah, Reddick right there in fifth. That's, Reddick's points right there. That's critical for that team as they look at a potential win for Harvick or just themselves just trying to fight to yeah. stay above that bubble. That's really important for them anytime they can get any stage points. Uh, they're few and far between for that team. Today's capitalizing. I was going to say, oh, Kyle Petty and Dale Jarrett, if we could have a camera on Mount Washington, they would be all the way down at Foxwoods, sponsor of the race. Yeah. It's beautiful. I've been there. It's a good place to hang out. You know, think about that. If somebody were to, you know, outside that top 16 win at Daytona or, or pull some great strategy somewhere, and that makes that interesting battle between Reddick and Austin Dillon very even important between teammates. two teammates. <laughs> yeah, because we got those road courts. You Daytona for sure. But, I mean, Chastain runs. You've mentioned it a couple times. He runs pretty good at the road course. Also got the Glen and Indy. See the guys negotiate the choose rule right here. So now are we going to finally set into a little bit of a rhythm? You know, that first stage was as broken up as any stage we have seen this year. This second stage longer. It's 110 you know, laps, 104 laps to go currently. So now will they be able to sit into a little bit of a rhythm? Dylan. Guys, real quick, Pit Road's a tricky place. Take a listen to what Chase Elliott battled on that last stop. And that box is super slick leaving. Like, 
Well, I broke an axle or something. Yeah, it's a common complaint here, unfortunately. Yeah, we heard about that uh, yesterday with uh, your son. Harrison Burton complaint. He's like, I, I knew we had that in the notes. I should have done a better job in the pit stall right there. So unusual challenge for a certain track here is very slick stalls getting in and getting out. Coming up on the restart, Geico's on. The restart zone is Denny Hamlin on the inside. And oh. Kevin Harvick's going to get a great start. Denny Hamlin had big time wheel spin. Ross Chastain takes a three wide down into turn one. Again on that apron through the water. He's not scared. A three wide into turn three. Everybody's oh. got to be aware. Chastain deep down into turn three. And Blaney's like, I was leading the race, and now I'm back here in this mess. Now Blaney fights back to the inside. See up ahead the battle for second between the eight car of Tyler Reddick. Doing an amazing job today. Chase was pushing the limits right there. Got his right front tire almost over that third seam. No grip outside of that. Yeah, you wouldn't think there would be much difference. You can see the difference in the color of the asphalt in that third seam that the nine car runs to the middle of the corner. You can tell they're very faded on that outside. It's really old asphalt. If you put the right front tire, the right rear tire out there, it's definitely going to go for a slide. You saw that left front splitter dragging on the eight car down the straight. Look how loose he is. That's just super low air pressure. That's going to make the car drive really well late in the run. But early in this run, the car just wiggles all around. Feels horrible. And look who's in the top five here, trying to take advantage of the mistakes. Denny Hamlin in this 11 car. Holding in on this eight. Tyler Reddick down the front straight away into turn one. Reddick to the bottom of the racetrack. It's going to give this 11 car of Denny Hamlin an opportunity to create some momentum. Getting a little bit of a hassle by Brad Kozlowski, maybe not allowing Denny to finish the corner the way he wants to. The 12 car, Blaney working his way back up through. He's gotten around a few, a few cars, including Ross Chastain. Ross is falling back to ninth place. That's a pretty bold move right there. It looks like Keselowski thinks he's got a little more pace than Denny's going to try to get around this 11 car on the turn two. Denny's going to fight back on the outside. Man, I'm surprised at how those cars were able to get down into turn three that deep, and it sticks. Look at where he comes off the corner. He loses almost no time making that much of a commitment to the entry. Well, as this battle continues up front, one driver who had a little bit of trouble, I wasn't sure what happened to 14 of Chase Briscoe. That's him rolling. That's not in slow motion. That's He's rolling around the apron, and now he's about two-thirds of a lap behind and since refired. Let's listen in. Sure. got it fired. That's his loop. Low oil protect access. Try resetting it. So he had some sort of low oil protection. The engine shut off or wouldn't run the full song. He apparently reset it or the car corrected itself. He's now underway, but 24 seconds behind the leader last car in the lead lap. Ah, oh, that's so frustrating. That's that check engine light you keep ignoring at home. Yeah. Officially, old bike. Look at this. His last key is all over the back of Tyler Reddick. Tyler is going to be a difficult pass. Watch Keselowski. Let's see if he tries to turn that car on corner exit to get a run. That's what he's trying to do. Reddick with good exit speed, though. You see it help Keselowski. So now he learned something. Can, if he gets close enough to Tyler Reddick, can he use that to ultimately try to make a pass? I'm surprised by the amount of grip these guys are finding in that bottom groove. I wonder if some of that temperature you mentioned earlier in the 60s, I mean, this is a track that I think, you know, we come up here and tire test in the spring when it's cooler, and it seems like the car has more grip. I think it's that, but it's also the applications of PJ1 in years past. Now, we've applied it to that very bottom groove in the third lane, but we practice, we run Xfinity cars, we run modifieds, and all sorts of vehicles. You can see the difference in the color in that third lane. It's a little bit lighter. I think that the PJ1 is still pretty active on that bottom groove, maybe giving these guys an advantage.
You think you can help design a sweet paint scheme for Kevin Harvick? Well, Bush Beer, we're going to give you that chance. Follow Bush Beer on Twitter and tweet the hashtag BushLightApple and the hashtag Sweepstakes during the last three laps of the remaining stages to enter. Pretty awesome run for, for this guy as he continues to lead. He's got a, over a second lead. Been a long time for Harvard to have yeah. that view, hasn't it? Oh, but you know it feels normal to him. And yeah. Hey, do you want to give this team momentum? Uh, I mean, you've had them on the ground. Do you want to let them up and give them momentum? They can become really dangerous really quick. I do think there are some teams, though, that are going to be players in the races that if they could go back and do stage one over again, they would not come to pit road. I think teams thought those new tires were going to help them. I think of Larson, who came down pit road, gave up a little track position. The 11 didn't have a choice. He kind of got in that accident. Uh, Blaney just hasn't executed the best at the, this stage kind of reset. So Harvick has the lead right now, but there's some players that are going to cycle to the front. Yeah, Larson getting himself back into the battle. He's got good speed, third fastest on the racetrack that lap. Making up ground from that pit strategy from early in the race we talked about, Steve. Been a big weekend for Larson, too. Won the Kings Royal, huge sprint car race at Eldora. Excited to see him win it. Oh, he got in the corner a little hot right there, way up out of the Holy groove. Holy smokes. Driving like a sprint car. Good save right there, gives up a lot of time, though. Have to clean the tires off. I was going to add it, not only a sprint car win, but contract extended. Right, Hedger Motorsports comes out and says, this guy is so good, which we all saw from the results, that we're going to sign him for a few more years to drive this five car. Not only that, but HendrickCars.com saying, hey, we've gotten so much positive results from this sponsorship, this car's not for sale anymore. We're going to take this car, we're going to commit to being on the quarter panels of this car. Yeah, it says a lot for NASCAR and where it's at as we see Danny Hamlin move by the eight of Reddick. Now, Reddick had an opportunity to do the crossover there and turn back underneath Denny Hamlin. Chooses not to do it. We saw him doing that with Brad Keselowski earlier in the race. And maybe that's Tyler Reddick saying, you know what? I've made a lot of mistakes. I've been making too many mistakes. He has said that. I'm making too many mistakes. Maybe that's Tyler Reddick saying, a long way to go. Let's be smart. Let's keep making this car better. See if that's better for him rather than trying to push so hard. All right, Bellamy trying to work his way back up through the field, Dylan. And guys, yeah, just a quick note on Blaney. So they lost all that track position on that stop. They had a wheel gun malfunction at the end of stage one. So took them from the front back to inside the top ten. And Blaney's continued to march forward here as he works hard in the left rear of Reddick. But car's really pretty good. Ryan's been pretty happy with it. It's doing exactly what he needs it to. Allowed him to advance forward so far with relative ease. So the eight car there of Tyler Reddick gives up that position. And Tyler Reddick had great early run speed. I think they can work on that. That was, <laughs> that was a huge move by Blaney right there. We see it time and time again, how they sail it off down into turn three. I mean, and we didn't do that. We did oh. We did not do that. I think that PJ1 down in that bottom groove gives them that ability. And etiquette, because when you two raced, if someone overdrove the corner and slid up in front of you, you would have hit him square in the bumper on exit. It was and a, been proud to it do was it. a yeah, free right. pass to run into the back of that guy. <laughs> you Absolutely. <did> <laughs> Everybody would say, yep, he deserved it. Oh, yeah. But now it's just part of racing. I will say, though, that the etiquette in racing for position and every position has changed as well, too. There was lots of give and take back 10, 15 years ago where these guys don't give and take as much anymore, and they work hard to maintain and keep positions on the racetrack. They didn't pay us points throughout the race. That's a great point. And they do, they do today. Unintended, but... It's, and I'm glad that that's the change they made because if it makes the racing more intense, makes the drivers work harder, makes them fight harder throughout the entire race, I'm all for it, especially up here in the booth. How about Chastain at the 42? You know, he I, gave this position up earlier and has worked his way back to the back bumper. The five is going to go around him for position. Here's a good battle on the racetrack between this 48 car, Alex Bowman. Yesterday's winner in the Xfinity Series, Christopher Bell. Christopher had some good speed early in the race. Trying to work his way back into the top 10 now, but having a little bit of trouble in this car. Pretty awesome stuff. Kevin Harvick out to an impressive lead over Chase Elliott. Brad Keselowski, Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blake.
The race is on. The first 500 fans to visit NASCAR.com slash Kids500 and you enter the code SOUND. You get a chance to take home a NASCAR Kids Club Toyota Camry diecast car. They're pretty excited to hear that promo. <laughs> Thank you for listening to you. See themselves on the big screen. We're going to ride on board with all these drivers right here and listen to uh, listen all of them at once. But look at them working there. Very challenging track. We sort of got to experience this last week in Atlanta. How hard it is to get around the track, how much they're working the steering wheel. Mainly on corner exit. These guys will be checking that right rear. Look at Harvick down there leading the race and sliding the right rear off the corner. Well, and as we are on board with Kevin Harvick, he was lapping Chase Briscoe, which was, man, Harvick used the wheel a lot. It was unfortunate for Joey Logano, because he was hoping to get that one of those, or that last lap back, but now Briscoe's the first car one. A little bit of lap traffic's allowed Chase Elliott to close in. Half a second here, this is gonna hold him up just a moment. And remember, Briscoe had that problem. Right. He's not as fast as the leader for sure, but he wouldn't be getting lapped right now without that mechanical issue to shut the car down. Third place battle right here. Keselowski holds on to it over Denny Hamlin. Hamlin let that two car go earlier in the run, but now he stalked him back down. Trying to put himself in position to find a weakness in this two car. Use it to get around him. Ooh, the two car got in the corner pretty deep there. See the 11 close up on the inside. These guys finished first and second last year with Keselowski winning. Right now, a battle for third and fourth. Marty. Watching two of the better cars in the long run here with Brad Kozlowski and Denny Hamlin. Problem is, they let Kevin Harvick check out a bit here. You know, Hamlin really hasn't been in the game much today, Jeff. They're finally on the tiles, tire cycle with everybody else. But talking to Chris Gabehart this morning, he said Denny has always been good at this racetrack. You guys were talking about how it suits his style. He said, in fact, I think without the PJ1 here, it plays to his hands even more because how you work the throttle in and off the corner, that's going to be even more critical today without the sticky stuff on the track. So the thought being there, Marty, is that with that traction compound that they used to apply, it made more grip. So was that an advantage to guys that aren't as smooth on the throttle? They don't have the feel that a Denny Hamlin has. It was an interesting conversation I had with Keselowski this morning. He said, it ain't gonna matter. It's gonna be the same track. Like he said, same for everybody. Yeah, he thought it just wasn't gonna make that big of a difference. I love unknowns. What I really like is teams didn't know till Friday. <laughs> right? But it wasn't, the traction compound wasn't going to be applied, and that made them make some really late adjustments. I can see why Brad might say, hey, the track's not changing. It doesn't matter. I won here last year. It's not going to bother me. It's not going to affect me. <laughs> Denny Hamlin's like, I didn't win. It's going to change the track. Now I'm going to win. Yeah, right. You gotta have That's like a lot, of, a lot of guys will say that this track this track's helps them for Phoenix. Unless they don't run good, then this, this don't help us. Not like Phoenix. We talked about Kevin Harvick leading with about a 1.3 second lead. Bottom of the screen is teammate, the 10 of Eric Almirola has driven up into the eighth position. So a great day for Harvick leading, but a solid day for SHR, you know, up inside the top 10 and even Cole Custer currently running 14. So three of the SHR cars inside the top 15. And Eric had an amazing, you know, a good year last year. He was pretty happy with the results they were having throughout the year. Good consistency, well in to the top 16 fighting for a playoff spot. And this year, it's been a disaster. Uh, the, their situation in the points is not very good at all. Not in the top 22, so they're in, you know, they're absolutely in a must-win situation. And we've seen them do it in a place like, you know, Daytona or Talladega. Going into that race, having that pressure on him, that might be one of the guys with the most pressure on himself when they go to Daytona for that cut race, that final race of the regular season. You mentioned the difference between this year and last year. Last year, this 10 car had 18 top 10s. So far this year, two. It's just been tough sledding. Well, last year, Eric Amarillo's teammate, Cole Custer, finished eighth in New Hampshire. I mean, the young driver has won a truck race here. We saw him down on pit road before the race. Man, you like this place? Yeah, he looked pretty excited. He was excited to go run. Just, you know, just had a little pep in his step. And here he is inside the top 15. Got a one 
got a win in his rookie season. Um, you know, the sophomore season has definitely not been as smooth as he wanted, but I think it's fair to say he's not sitting in the same equipment. I mean, the overall company is not running in the same place. And uh, But here he is, you know, racing, racing inside the top 50. This was a racetrack where Cole Custer put himself on the map in a truck race, late restart. Started about in second or third row, and drove around everybody and won the race. And it was the moment, I think, when the industry took notice that this kid might have the talent. Still, still needs a little more time, I think. And you're right, this company isn't where they want to be to be able to give him the cars they need. Marty. And speaking of this 41 team, after eight straight finishes of 17th or worse, Steve is a team leader. You just want base hits, right? And that's what they need at this point. Nice battle there. Finally, Denny Hamlin gets by Brad Kozlowski on the top of your team. But for Cole Custer in this race team, you know, what would you say, Steve? Top 15, if they come out of here with a top 10, top 15, that's a good day for the team, pointing them back in the right direction. Doesn't have to be a win, just a nice solid day. Well, they haven't run inside the top 15 since so all the way back at Dover. So at some point, you have to say, hey, man, no dents, top 15. Let's try to move this forward. You talk about that truck race that he won. He was 16 years old. Wow. He was the youngest truck winner ever. And when he won that race, and you talked about it putting him on the map, it did. It was a big win for his whole career. Yeah, but still only 23, right? We talk about him like, oh, third year old, old man. Second year at Cup, he's getting older, 23 years old. Just ride along. The helmet cam with Bubba Wallace, DoorDash cam. Man, I love that app. Yeah. Use it all the time, but let's see what Bubba's dealing with inside the car, what it's like for a driver riding around this racetrack. There's not many bumps. You see a little movement in the helmet, but really pay attention now as he goes through turn two. Down the back straightaway, using that apron on corner exit. Watch the bumps right here at the end of this straightaway. All the way down, boom, still going through bumps. All the way down into the braking zone, turning the wheel. That's when you really can easily lock up the front tires on these race cars if you're braking and turning. And those bumps continue, not just on entry, but down into the corner. One of the most difficult things about this racetrack for drivers is trying to get through those bumps. And if the car is hitting the splitter and doing all kinds of bad things, there's nothing you can do about it. Also, as you're watching, look at his visuals. On the right are braking marks. And on the track itself, see those seams? See those white lines right above DoorDash on his dashboard? That's his visual marker. So, off turn four, down the front straightaway. You're immediately looking to the right side, right there. Four, three, two, one. That's your braking marks. Now you're picking up, where do I need my left front tire to be? Where do I need to be on this racetrack? Great references here. Can really help put your car where it needs to go. Love riding along these onboards, especially that helmet cam. One of the best cameras we've got. Let's see what the drivers are dealing with out on this racetrack.
Kevin Harvick dominating today, and he's done it before 2018. He beats Kyle Busch with the bump and run. And then 2019, takes it to Denny Hamlin for another win. Wonder if he can keep it going today and get that, that win box checked for 2021. Download the official app of NASCAR and follow the action with free live scoring in-car cameras and a radio broadcast. Upgrade to premium for full access to driver audio channels and a completely ad-free experience. Search NASCAR in your app store to download and start a free trial today. Kevin Harvick talked about it. 48 laps led the day. Most he's led previously in 21 races this season, 39. and we. Saw something similar last week. Kurt Busch did the same thing, led more to Atlanta than he did the entire season. Goes on to win the race. And you want to talk about the tale of two seasons? A year ago, Harvick had 800 laps led at this point. 800. I mean, that is a shocking change from one year to the next. You know, I talked to Kevin earlier this week, and he didn't really expect to come here and run this well. He was concerned coming. See how much he's working. He's in that car, he's leading the race. Still the workload's high, but he wasn't all that optimistic. He said, hey man, look, I know my team's working and we got good stuff. I know how to get around this racetrack, but we just haven't been near good enough. It would take a big change for us for us to win this race. The double Quentin zero's in three. the wall. Yep, we got a car in the wall, Quinn Huff. In the fence, down in turn three and four. Looks like some damage on the left side of the left rear. Deck lids wrinkled up. That was the longest green flag run in 45 laps, and Austin Dillon was on pit road. Yeah, that's difficult for Austin. He's going to lose a lap doing that. And there you see the damage to the Permatex, double zero. Yeah. Difficult. It looked like couple cars bunched up down there side by side trying to get through that turn three entrance over those bumps. Let's take a look here. Oh, he got a little help. Down in the corner looks like possibly Ryan Newman. I hate to That looked like Ryan Newman. Yeah, I hate to assume, but old Ryan might have sent him down in the corner a little faster than he wanted to go. First car lap down was Chase Briscoe, so he'll get the free pass here. And Austin that. Dillon will lose a lap. I'm sorry, Junior, I mean, he step on you there. You pointed out he was on pit road. And again, Joe Logano not able to put himself in position to try to get that lap back that he lost earlier in the race. Let's take another look at this, this crash here. So Ryan Newman from way back. Chases the double zero in. And yeah, I have to wonder. I don't know if something happened earlier that upset Ryan or if Quinn didn't get into the corner as well as Ryan anticipated. It looked like the left front was locked up on the sixth car right trying to contact. avoid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either Ryan might have overcooked the corner or Quinn just didn't get in there like Ryan anticipated. Either way, Quinn's not happy. No. No. I'm sure you of that. Permatex, longtime sponsor in this series, been around sponsoring races forever. They used to have the Permatex 300. Daytona. Man, you're throwing it way back. Way, way back in the 70s. It was a big race for the sportsman guys. And you just hate that, you know, the double zero. We talk a lot about these smaller teams that are coming out here and, and trying to find their way through the sport, trying to build programs and damage like this. It's more than just a bad day, right? There's a financial repercussion for that double zero, so just unfortunate. All right, Kevin Harvick's team picked up four spots last time on pit road to get the lead. Pit here in just a little bit. Let's see if they do it again. Yeah, Track position's of, huge. <laughs> we're kind of in the same boat we were earlier, where it's right in the middle of the stage. And uh, I think everybody comes, though, to come down pit road and get these tires. 55 yeah. laps on these tires, no advantage to stand out here. No, everybody has to come to pit road halfway through this second stage. Car Sports on Sirius XM. Pete Pistone, Backman. NASCAR Radio Channel 90. Jeff Burton's going to be calling in August 4th. Live Wednesdays, 9 a.m. Eastern. Jeff, you ready? I'm ready. That's the week of Watkins Glen. It's always fun talking to those guys. It is fun. They get some good questions. Yeah. 
had some great, great conversations. And then we're doing radio style Watkins Glen. So out on the racetrack, Steve, you and Rick be up in the air conditioning, but Junior and I be out there working. That's right. Well, I'll be listening, man. <laughs> Dylan, we got cars coming to pit road, buddy. Yes, we do, and Chase Elliott will be the first one in. So last time down, they made an air pressure adjustment and a track bar adjustment. Maybe went a little bit too far on the air pressure, but the track bar change was good. They're going to do more of that to give Chase a little bit more rear grip, along with four Goodyear's and Sunoco fuel. Kevin Harvick will pit as well from the race lead, said that he doesn't have rear grip at all, and it's getting worse at the top of his screen. Four uh, Goodyear's and fuel as well, Marty. You see the wedge adjustment for Danny Hamlin. He said, I could stand to be tighter at so three. I can't get pointed in the middle of the corner. Meanwhile, Brad Kozlowski talked about how slick his stall was on that first stop, like a lot of other drivers did, including Chase Elliott. We'll see if that first stall helps Brad Kozlowski here. He said the last change didn't help me at all. Harvick holds the lead. Kozlowski in Hamlin game one spot. Great race off of pit road again for Kevin Harvick and his team. They hang on to the lead here at New Hampshire. NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by Ford, built Ford proud, and by DoorDash. Get more from your neighborhood. Well, we did some investigating. Watch Quinn, that double zero car, hand out the window, like saying, hey, man, I'm giving you the inside. Just, I'm going to get out of your way and give you the inside, and then as they go down in the corner, Ryan Newman gets into the back of him and Rex Quinn, see right here. The only thing I can figure is that Quinn was trying to get out of the way and Ryan just misjudged, you know, how slow he was going. And Quinn's like, man, I told you to bottom. What do you want me to do? Just understand the frustration. I like how Quinn used the damaged side of his car to go retaliate. Now, I probably wouldn't have thought that well and probably would have used the right front. <laughs> but he's like, you know what? I'm going to get this guy. And I'm not going to make my car any worse than it already is. Pretty smart. Seeing the field handle the, uh, the choose rule here. A couple guys had some issues on pit road. The eight of Reddick, you said, Jeff, had some issues. And the uh, 24 of Byron lost some spots. The eight. He was six. He slid through the box. The 24 was 15th, and he made contact with either a tire or a crew member. We'll get an update from Pitt Road just to see what happened. Either way, it was a slow smooth off. Yeah, Steve, it was Ryan Patton, the tire carrier for William Byron. He's fine. Give me a thumbs up. We are digging for the replay right now, but he's all good. That's great news. Ryan, a longtime Hendrick crew member, so it's great to see. 
checked out by Rob Lopes. He's a pit stall. Time. Yeah, pit stall in front yeah, of him. So a long time pit crew employee Hendrick, years ago. Fields wrapping around turns three and four to the exit of turn four, approaching the Geico restart zone. Kevin Harvick, Denny Hamlin up front. We've seen this before. Kevin Harvick gets away to a clean restart. Look at Reddick back there making it three wide. Harvick is unreal out of the restart zone. Acceleration. Oh, Reddick trapped down on that apron. Can he make it work? You dive down there and try to get all kinds of positions. Sometimes it works out for you, sometimes it doesn't. Three three starts are tough. I think the guy on the outside has the momentum on corner exit, has the drive off. The guy on the bottom is fighting. Oh, there's going to be contact right there between the 10 and the 9. Chase dove into the corner and got to the inside. Leaned on the 10 car. Now they're three wide. Larson down on the inside. A little blocking in the back here between the 42. And now Marola's got to recognize they're three wide. Just oh. use all the racetrack. Chase into the side of him again. I believe he knows. <laughs> I believe he's aware. Fights hard to get back in front of that nine. Nah, man, you get ticked off when a guy does that. You fight him hard. You're like, you got to take this spot for me. First, you're not going to hit me again. I'm going to take this spot back. And on top of that, I've had a bad year. And i gotta, I got to fix it right now. See, Bill. More contact. The side of Blaney. Yeah. Car sparking over the bumps into turn three. There's. Oh, Christopher Bell almost contact between him and Matt Benedetto. Reddick's, Matt getting a little bit loose. Reddick's still on the apron back there. He's run about three laps on the apron. Let's see. This eight car going to try the apron again. He runs a low lane. How abruptly will it turn for an exit? These restarts are physical contact right there. Oh. The big spin. Chris Busher comes around. Bubba Wallace. Damage to the right and side of the 17. The front. Right front's flat. So lucky they spun down the entrance of the road course, missed that interior wall. Damage to the left side. There's that right front tire down on the 17. Chris Busher's Ford. Chris Busher was looking so good in the points about a month and a half ago, and since then, nothing's gone right. Longtime sponsor, Fast and All, on board for this Roush Ford. Trying to get his way back to pit road. And yeah, we talked to Chris this week. You could just hear that, regardless of what he was saying, you could hear the disappointment, just trying to figure out what to do. Now, the concern here is no interliners at the one-mile track, so we see some sparking. You know, that could be the sway bar arm, could be other pieces of suspension. Let's take a look at what happened, guys. So see the contact with the eight right there, but something happening behind them. The 23 just gets loose off the corner. I don't know if he had any help there, but he just gets loose off the corner and nowhere for the 17 of Busher to go. And you're right, they were very lucky where they were on the racetrack not to have worse contact. I don't know, maybe Busher got into the back of him and helped him around and got Bubba loose off the corner. Can't really see. I feel like Busher, there was some contact behind yep. from Stenhouse just as Busher tried to slow up. Stenhouse couldn't get slowed up. So you see right here, just a tight battle. It looks like, I don't know if yeah, the 23 like had much help. Didn't seem to be. Fair lead 17. you 99 okay. now, one back yep. 17. There you go. Looks like a little contact with the 99 on the left front fender. Upset Bubba's car a little bit. So right there, the 99 and Bubba get together. And that brings the back, that kind of whips the back of his car around suddenly. Chris Busher with nowhere to go. Good job by all these guys back here. 24, Byron, a few other guys. Could have been collected in that with a few wrong moves. And that orange and blue number 22 that went through the smoke. He was going to be finally, after 140 laps, Joey Logano has found his way back into the lead lap. We were talking about it earlier in the race, how it must be frustrating. He continued to miss out on that opportunity every caution, but here he is with a position to put himself back in the lead lap. And now he has to figure out how to get creative. 
to find that track position. He's not going to pass all these cars and just drive to the front, but what can his crew chief do to try to get creative with track position? Well, with a free pass here, once he gets his lap back, he'll absolutely come to pit road, no penalty not to. He's going to have to start at the tail of the field. So then you're kind of on your own window. See what kind of yellows come in. To your point, see how far he can drive up in the field, right? Right now, I'm thinking I need to really help him out. But if he can drive that car into the top 10, top 15, top 18, you know, don't gamble your way out of a good run. Like sometimes just be happy you're back in the lead lap. <laughs> Come say, on. You know what? If we get in the top 50, we're going to get Don't be concerned here. now, I mean, Steve. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, depend. Let me see how fast he is, and I'll give you my answer. There's 27 cars in the lead lap. And been I've been watching Logano. Like, he hasn't really been able to pass a lot of people. He doesn't seem like he has a ton of speed, although, you know, he's back in the lead lap and anything could happen. But, you know, with that many cars on the lead lap, you got to go through, and without a really fast car, you're going to have to play some kind of tricks. All right, so we mentioned on the last set of pit stops, the 24 of William Meyer, a longtime crew member, Ryan Patton, had a little contact. Let's take a look right here. They're coming to the right side. You know, this is what you're going to see, the six of Ryan Newman entering his pit stall catches the tire that Ryan Patton was carrying, spun him around. So that was a very fortunate situation for no crew members being injured either by the contact of the six or those tires. I mean, you talk about a 50 pound tire slinging around down there. That can do some damage. There's Mr. Patton right there. Want to get on TV, but not for this. You want to be like, want the game winning move or the, look, he's hiding. He's like, nope. Those guys definitely, you know, it's it's kind of become very similar to what we have in in stick and ball sports, where there's a there's a backup, someone playing a backup position to him, right? He doesn't want to give that guy an opportunity to step into that role. He doesn't want to have to sit out a week or a few weeks and allow someone else to come in there and perform and take that job away. Marty, what you got? Before this caution, Junior, we had a little action up front between the 10 car of Eric Almarola and Chase Elliott. So what did Almarola think about that move by the nine? Take a listen. What the hell with the nine? He just dove way down in there. If I didn't give him a lane, he was going to just destroy us. They're just not used to getting past, but they might as well get used to it. Oh, how about that from Eric Almarola? I would say, Burton, that's New Hampshire, right? Because that's what it is. It's fighting for every inch you can on the bottom of the track. Yeah, it is, and it's also a driver and a team that hadn't had a good year. They're like, look, I'm not taking it from you, right? I'm not taking it. I'm up here. I've earned this spot. I'm going to race you hard. Got to stay on your ground. I was always the diffuse type, though, not the oh, egg on type. Because I don't believe it. I was. You know, the only thing I'll say is I like Almirola standing up for himself. But, you know, I don't want to make him any more frustrated than he currently is. Let, let, let's. You know, unfortunately, we need the good run perhaps more than Chase does. So let's just remember that and try to keep this thing going straight. Fans getting ready for Premier Lacrosse League, the all-star game. The coverage is going to begin for you folks on CNBC. Coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern. Speaking of athletes, those guys, they are some incredible athletes. Aero coverage brought to you by Geico as we roll up to the Geico restart zone again. Kevin Harvick, man, he's going to have an advantage before the green comes out. Denny Hamlin doesn't look like he's even ready. Here comes Ross Chastain again to the inside to the apron. It's like Denny was sleeping a little bit. It's going to cost him a few spots here. Chase Elliott slips a little bit off the corner. Man, that was just an odd, odd looking restart on that inside road. Kevin has the ability to go anytime inside the zone, and he was ready and firing. Well, Keselowski's ready to go, too. He's putting all kinds of pressure. He's underneath Kevin Harvick down the front straightaway. Brad being really patient with the throttle, trying to stay off of the back bumper of that four car. He did a good job there. He could have easily gotten to the back of him. Harvick's going to let him have that spot. Veteran move there. Let you go, man. I'll try to catch you later. Car doesn't feel really good right now for the four firing off on these sticker tires. Bell into the back of Chastain. Kind of sideways off the corner. Everybody stayed straight, but it's definitely stacked this field up. You know who loved that was Tyler Reddick on the bottom of that eight car. Kind of cleared the path for him. Got by two cars pretty quickly. Ross has been pretty aggressive today, trying to take every opportunity he can on these restarts, and that's what you got to do. This is one reason why we talk about track position here as we take another look at it. The 20 
big contact with the left rear oh, of the man. 42. Big save. And Kurt Busch, great job. Great job by Kurt Busch not to get in the back of Bell right there. What I was going to say is that's what makes it so difficult, Junior, to come get new tires or whatever. It's just there's no clean racing back there. I mean, they're two wide, three wide. It's not like a big, wide, sweeping mile and a half or two mile track. You can get away from one another. That's your chance. Get everybody in a big bunch, man. You got to go on a restart. Everybody gets aggressive. Look at it. Different grooves. Oh, Matty Deal on the outside. Really loose on corner exit. William Byron right there, back up to 14th after that pit stop we showed you where he lost a few positions. Not by their doing. Contact from another car to the crew member, but William getting him back in this race here. It's a difficult position to be in. Where do you go? Look at, look at Bowman trying to make it three wide, driving underneath Kurt. Matty D. Saying, stay down there. I'm going to take the outside, try to get on the outside of you. Oh, look at all the racetrack. It's crazy there's any grip down there whatsoever. See, Bowman has nowhere to go, right? A lot of times when you see a guy drive in the corner like that, he can slide in front of someone, but Kurt was on the outside. They were all lined up on the outside. Now, Bowman is hoping he can clear this. If not, that outside line could just freight train him here. And look how the one of Kurt Busch kind of run him a little shallow on that corner entry and takes away any advantage he has. Dylan, what you got on that 48? Well, it's amazing, Junior, when you look back at the history of Alex Bowman at this racetrack, he's never scored stage points or led a lap here. This has really been a thorn in his side. So talking with Greg Ives, the crew chief, this morning, he said, hey, we're confident. You know, we may not go up here and win, but we have to feel like we do. We have to have that confidence that even though this place has been our nemesis, that we've done all the right things to put us in position to contend. So I know they want to be a little bit better than battling for 12th or 13th like they are right now, but uh, Alex is still working on getting this race car a little better. He's put a lot of effort effort into getting himself better at this racetrack. So that's about all you can do is stick around, put yourself in position, do your work off the track, and just hope for the best. So that's what they're doing right now, just trying to have a clean day and get this thing inside the top 10. Just crossed the halfway mark in the race, so this race is official. Started a little bit late due to the weather. Running up against darkness here, whether we can get the full 301 in is left to be seen. Great battle right here, the nine car. Chase Elliott trying to get around Eric Almarola. These guys had a little, little fender trade, a little bumper, bumper tag there earlier. So now they're, they're back together. If you're Chase, do you know you got into it last time or are you just whatever, it's racing as normal this time? I think you feel, I think Chase probably, you know, felt a little guilty about that. That was just a little mistake on his part. So he's probably gonna try to make this pass as cleanly as possible, but I think that the 10 car is holding him up a little bit, so you can't wait too long. You have to race hard. Look at him, get up under the back bumper of that 10 car, trying to get him loose up up, up the racetrack. Not able to do it. When you do make a mistake, Steve, and get in the side of somebody, you try to cut that guy a little bit of slack because when you do pass him, now he's behind you. And he can put you in a bad situation right here. Now Marola, see his car shaking, wiggling, back of the car loose. Chase Elliott dove, dove to the bottom. Remember, if you're looking for the Premier Lacrosse League All-Star Game from San Jose, California, that's coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern on CNBC. We're going to stick with this battle here, guys. We're going to take a break, but you're going to see all of it in NASCAR nonstop.
Back in New Hampshire where Brad Kozlowski continues to lead over Kevin Harvick. Ryan Blaney's moving into second place around Denny Hamlin. You're looking at the battle right here for fifth place. It continues to rage on. Chase Elliott, Eric Almirola. Chase just passed Eric a few laps ago, but Eric's hanging tight. I like to use the word rage because I think there's a little rage in that 10 car. There was contact a little bit ago. Now, this has been clean since, but I think there's some extra motivation for Eric. He is unhappy with this nine, and he wants to prove a point. Well, on top of that, the only way Eric's season is going to go into the playoffs is win. Right? That's, that's, he's not going to be able to point himself in. So sitting there running six, he can see it from where he is. It's really only the first time all year he could see a win. So that gives you optimism. It steps up the intensity. So interesting to me, too. We saw this in the Xfinity race where a guy is having trouble. Somebody's right on his back bumper. The pass is made, but then the lead card. You see it. Eric upset, <laughs> pushing that nine car into the corner. Man, this seems wanna... to be a very aero effective racetrack as far as the lead car versus the trailing car. When one passes one, it sort of does change the balance. It's a big balance shift. So I was wondering if Chase would say, all right, he's getting a little upset with me, but Chase drove it down in the corner with him. I don't know. I mean, I think if these guys are racing together for the first time, I think Chase would probably let that go, but eventually, you're going to get underneath his skin. Oh, I think we're there. Oh, I think between think, the two yeah. of them. Larson's like, hey, guys, did you guys get single file? Because I Just really let don't. let me through. Yeah, I want no part of this. Again, folks, the premier lacrosse league all-star game that's currently over on CNBC. You looking for that? We race here at New Hampshire, a little bit delayed by the weather. Hey, 21 sure. laps to go in stage two. You're a lacrosse fan. You tuned in. Some good yeah. racing. Hey, I, did you know the year that I retired from driving, I played across summer I, league. I don't really. Believe I did. I don't believe it. I did. It was funny to watch, I'm sure, but I enjoyed it. Did it, it end in injury or oh, by choice? Oh, yeah, I had an injury walking to the field on my last game. That's the truth. <laughs> I had a hamstring injury. Oh, parking lot. End of my season. Chase Elliott just not able to get away from this tent car, but they're driving away from Kyle Larson as they continue to battle. Chase slips up the racetrack, jumps the cushion a little bit there. It's an opportunity for Eric to get clear. He was going to do it off turn two. Now let's see, can Eric drive away from this nine car? Will the nine's balance shift to a little bit of a tighter car and allow him to hang on to the back of this 10? If you could see Eric's face right now, it'd be a great big smile. Finally, got by. It's clearly a little bit quicker. He's looking at, he's looking at his crew down the front straightaway. Did y'all see that? <laughs> and I did. I pressured him into making a mistake. <laughs> Let's do a KFC through the field. Start with Marty. And we'll start through the field with Brad Keselowski. Remember that first stop, he said, the adjustment you made to Jeremy Bowens, his crew chief, didn't help. He came on the radio a moment ago, said that last adjustment, much better. Out front right now. And I asked him before the race, with the announcement out, how does that help? He said, hey, it lets all of us move forward. Clearly, I've known what's going to happen for next year for a few weeks. But now everyone knows his announcement coming in a few weeks, Dylan. And Marty in the second spot. Kevin Harvick currently holds down that position. Talk to Rodney Childers, the crew chief, before the race just about their struggles this year. And he said, hey, all we can do is continue to bring the best cars that we can to the racetrack. They did that same thing last year, won nine races. So it's a different story this year, but I think you're seeing the fruits of their labor, their hard work in, their sh in the race shop. Kevin certainly has done his job as well behind the wheel. Been mostly satisfied with the race car today. Pick crew doing their job too, got him three spots on that first stage. Behind him, Ryan Blaney in the third spot. Biggest thing they wanted to focus on this weekend was just good entry security. Todd Gordon said that would open up their options a lot as far as what kind of adjustments they made to the race car. So we saw him make a pass for the lead earlier, cut the car to the bottom of the racetrack. I think that's the proof that that's exactly what they needed to do. Still marching forward, too, after that wheel gun issue, Marty. You know, when I talked to Chris Gabehart this morning, the crew chief for Denny Hamlin, he said this is the most important race left in the regular season for three reasons. Number one, he said it's similar to Phoenix. We feel like we can learn.
learn things that will help us for the last race of the year. Number two, with the Olympic break, you're the winner for two weeks. That's a lot of momentum. And number three, if it's us in victory lane, that would be the breakthrough win we need for the 11 team. Right now, Denny Hamlin saying the car much better in the short run. That's been his struggle. Meanwhile, Eric Amarola, a little bit further back, sitting there in the fifth position, finally got around Chase Edmund, or Chase uh, Elliott, his spotter, Joel Edmonds, was telling him, keep pressuring the nine. Eventually, he'll make a mistake, and he did. They were able to get by, and he'll tell you, here at New Hampshire and Daytona, they feel like they're places they can win to put them in the playoffs, Dylan. And Marty, track position so important here in New Hampshire. That was the message Alan Gustafson, crew chief for Chase Elliott, delivered to his driver before the start of the race. He said, we've got to be aggressive. We can't lose this track position. I think that's why you saw him racing Eric Almirola so hard there. They know they can't backslide too much further. It's hard to make up ground here at New Hampshire. Chase admits this isn't his best racetrack. The balance is starting to slip away from him, trying to get it dialed back in, Marty. Kyle Larson having a solid day right now in the seventh position. Cliff Daniels has told me this morning, told me this is the biggest question mark left for us in the regular season. He said at this type of racetrack, we have struggled so far this year. We're trying a few things today so far. Not too bad for Larson. Easily in the top ten, Dylan. And Tyler Reddick runs behind him in the eighth spot. Great run for them. Admittedly, short tracks have not been their strong suit this year, but this one they felt was going to maybe be a little bit different. Finished tenth here last year, so expected to be a little bit better than normal, and they have been. Tyler has been really happy with the race car. Slipped through his skull the last time down, so that dropped into 13th. So, walling their way back into the top 10, but they've got a really good race car, as does the car behind him, Ross Jastain in the 42. His best finish here in two starts, just 25th. But I think you're seeing the benefit of having a teammate in Kurt Busch that won last week. Ross said himself that that proved to him that these Chip Ganassi cars can do it. He's got to get better behind the wheel. He's certainly delivering today. He's been inside the top 10 all afternoon long, Marty. Dylan, er Dylan early on, Christopher Bell looked like he might have a car that could maybe pull off the weekend sweep, but they are struggling right now. He said the biggest issue is rear lateral grip. If Adam Stevens is going to get his driver up there and winning contention, he's going to have to make a big change on this next stop. And Junior, he might lose 10th here to Kurt Busch. And Kurt Busch rebounding, trying to work his way back to the field. Look here. Run up on Ross pretty quickly on corner exit there. Ross having a little trouble with the back grip of that car. Kurt Busch still battling the inside here. Christopher Bell off turn two. I think they both have a little more pace than Ross. We're going to stay with this battle, guys. You won't miss a thing. We're going to stay NASCAR nonstop.
You're watching NASCAR Cup Series Racing from New Hampshire, Foxwoods Resorts Casino 301. And Brad Keselowski continues to lead the field over Kevin Harvick. Comfortable second lead over the four car. Brian Blaney, Denny Hamlin, Eric Allen with a great, great effort today. Hendrick Carr is back there in sixth and seventh. Look at that guy down there in 16th. The target, you talked about it. Logano needs to drive through this field a little bit to give himself a chance. Yeah, as we ride on board with the 22, Jeff, you and I were looking at lap times. He can't quite match the top five, top six, but I think he is, you know, a good 10th, 5100 faster than everyone in front of him up to ninth or eighth. So I think he gets a couple more or maybe just one more with Byron here in the last four laps. A good pit stop try to race out that final stage. He can at least recover from what was a trying day and a rough start. Listen to him work. Oh, he was out of that gas a long time, isn't he? And let the car roll through the middle of the corner. Just ride along, listen. Look how much faster he is than William Byron. Three laps to go in the stage. Can he get him? It takes a lot of discipline to, to stay this low on the track. To, to lift, brake, slow the car down, and not allow it to slide up into that lane that Byron's in. Yeah, that lap he ran right there was the fifth fastest on the racetrack. Joey Logano in his 22 Ford Performance Cam riding along with him. This is where he gets hard. Now he can't use all of the racetrack as he gets to William Byron. Let's we'll see, he's gonna drive to the bottom, maybe get next to William Byron right here. But when he goes to turn the wheel, he has to turn it even sharper because he can't run out. If he does, he runs out and gets to the side of William Byron. Does not let the rear tires work the way he wants it to. All this is going on, Brad Kozlowski. Gonna work his way off of turn four and claim the stage two win. This is only Brad's second stage win of 2021. That's a wild stat. Battle for 10th right here. All important stage point. It's gonna go to Kurt Busch over Christopher Bell who won the Xfinity Series race yesterday. A lot of great action in stage two. Kevin Harvick leading early in the race. A little action here between the six car and the double zero. Another spin on the racetrack with Bubba Wallace. But Bragg is last. Takes it.
Back in New Hampshire, in the stage two. Cars rolling through turns three and four, approaching pit entrance. We've got an open pit road. A lot of guys making the pit stop here, preparing for that stage three. Dylan. Been a good day for the four car, Kevin Harvick. They'll pit from the second spot. Said that the back was taking off the first 20 laps of the run, but then it started to build with a struggling condition through the uh, through the center of the corner on throttle and corner exit. So a wrench in the back window there, four tires and fuel for Harvick. Little free in and off is the report for Ryan Blaney as he's run inside the top five as well, Marty. Denny Hamlin said the entry is a little bit better, but still too free. Center of the corner on exit as well. Brad Kozlowski said much better on this run, but then Jeremy Boland said, I hear you, but I think the track is changing a little bit, so I'm gonna make some adjustments here, trying to keep up with the racetrack. Kozlowski does hold serve here on pit road, but barely over Kevin Harvick, and still drivers talking about how slick it is here on pit road, still very cool in New Hampshire. Yes. Great advance for Christopher Bell and Alex Bowman, plus three for both. There you see the battle off pit road getting tight. Remember that too has that straight shot off pit road with the 18 being out. Yeah, that's gotta help him, right? Not spin those tires. I keep talking about traction. Well, if you don't the wheel turn the straight. Yeah, right, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, let's check in with Kyle Petty and Dale Jarrett at the end of stage two here. What are you seeing so far, man? How about the resurgence of the Fords here, KP? We've I been know. talking about this running up front. And so Ford's sitting in on his sofa somewhere watching this, feeling a lot better about the Ford contingents today. But uh, Brad Keselowski showing that last year was no fluke. Uh, came back up, took the lead. Kevin Harvick having a great day there. But this is going to be a real battle, especially as these drivers, once again, it's starting to get a little bit darker out here. That's going to be a factor. That is going to be a factor. And if Dick NASCAR does what they've done before at some point in time, they just say, that's the end. We're going to run 10 or 15 laps, whatever it is. It becomes a high stakes game of musical chairs. Yeah. So this is going to be an intense stage. We might not get this whole stage in, but the intensity is going to ramp up big time when they drop the green flag. Yeah, and we're still seeing some great battles with, with people. And Eric Almarola up there battling. He knows he's got to win if he wants to be in the playoffs. Uh, he's got his hands full outrunning his other forwards. But you can see him and Chase Elliott, they had a great battle during that latter stages of that stage. Yeah, Junior, I heard you say that Denny was asleep on the last restart. He better not be asleep on this restart. Well, there is some news on this 11 car. A little trouble on pit road, Marty. Yes, they had to come back down, Junior. Why? Listen to the radio. Do you have a wheel coming off? Yeah, you'll have to come back. The left front had a lug nut jump behind the wheel. Got to come back. Man, what a timing for this, Steve. Remember last week they had the speeding penalty in at Atlanta. That was on Denny. This time just happened a lug nut got caught behind the wheel as they put it on the left side. Incredible. And we've seen how hard it is to pass here in New Hampshire. Hamlin's going to have to start way in the back and might be out of a shot for a win here. Who knows? Because we might not have the full distance. If you guys have talked about, we may be racing the dark instead. Man, that's such a just unfortunate, almost bad luck. A lug nut goes between the little opening the wheel land on the hub when you put the new tire on it doesn't pull up tight and you saw the tire change and no you know nose right away but in the orchestration of the pit stop you just don't expect that and with the way things are going today and the darkness out there in front of us and not knowing where this race is going to end that could be this could be the last stop this could be the last opportunity for for those guys on pit road and so Denny Hamlin looking at having to drive through the field to have any shot at this. So NASCAR, Steve, has come out and told the teams how they're going to handle this potential darkness issue. So, so many problems at the start of this race. This race is running very long, still 111 laps to go. So what NASCAR is going to do, Steve, is inform the teams with, and say, hey, it's 10 to go until the race is going to be over. Basically, they're going to run until it's too dark or close to too dark and say 10 to go. We asked, hey, why don't you just give a distance? They said, well, if this runs green for the last 111, we're going to be really close to the finish, if not the finish. And we don't want to, you know, short the fans out as many laps as possible. It really comes down to what kind of race we see. Bunch of cautions. Heck, this could definitely be the last stop, right? We might only get a handful of green flag laps. And then my next question was, who's going to determine and how are you going to determine when it's too dark? And they're going to ask it. They're going to get information from the drivers and also their spotters on the racetrack. You can't really trust the drivers because they're going to tell you whatever they want to tell you that best suits them. So they're just going to have to use their spotters out on the racetrack. You don't think it's going to be darker for the leader than it is oh, guy trying to catch him, him, is it? You can see out there. 
I think the intensity is about to pick up in these cars. These guys just not knowing where this finish is going to end. So as a driver, you just got to run as hard as you can every single lap and every single corner. That's always a good combination. What you go wrong? <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be great for us. Field approaches the Geico restart zone. Brad Kozlowski, his teammate on the inside, Ryan Blaney. Brad getting a lot of shove here from the four car of Kevin Harvick. Kevin just trying to help him on that restart zone. Kevin not able to hang on the outside, though. Gets a great run off of turn two. Right behind these guys, Kyle Larson in the top five. Gets a little bit loose under the 10 car. Does a great job of saving it. Harvick struggling with his car right now. He drove into three. The car went way up the racetrack. Seen him kind of have difficulties on sticker tires the last run where he had to give the lead up to Brad Kozlowski. But he doesn't want to lose too much more track position. He's going to have to fight hard. The Pinsky boys are drawing away. Different lines for both these drivers. Brad in low. 12 of Blaney and a little bit higher and cuts down across the apron. I love that lane that Blaney ran. Look at how much of an advantage it was on corner exit. He's going to do it again. High entry. This front end has to work in the middle. He's going to take a sharp left hand turn and a much straighter exit. I think the 12 car in the last run was the best car in the long run. So if he could just stay within striking distance of Brad, I think he's got a great chance of putting the pressure on as they run. Using a little bit of a lower exit off of turn four, allows him to draw back up to the back of this two car. Down near one and two, though, Brad Kozlowski a little bit better, Marty. And Junior, that's a terrific point by Steve. I think Jeremy Bowen saw that because Brad was saying, hey, car is good, but Bowens was saying, you know what? I hear what you're saying, but I feel like the racetrack is changing and maybe he felt like they were going to give up a little bit on the long run. So Steve, is that when the crew chief kind of vetoes the driver and say, I know what you're feeling. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's where we're going to go. But well, it's your responsibility. Blaney can only tell you what he feels from the seat. He doesn't have track temp. He doesn't have the scanner listening to other drivers. He doesn't have everyone's lap time. So, Jeff, I really appreciate your feedback, but you have to believe me and trust me. I have a bigger picture. Put the two together, we try to make good decisions. That's trust. That's what that is. That's driver, crew, chief, trust. Dylan, what you got? Well, it's interesting, guys, watching this 12 car chase down the two. Todd Gordon, the crew chief on the 12, said that he learned some things watching this two car last year on their way to victory that they wanted to apply to their own race car today. Wouldn't exactly say what it was, but said, we definitely watched and learned last year. He is right on the back bumper of that two car, racing him for the lead now. Oh, he is all over him. Turns underneath him now. Good forward momentum into the corner. Look at Brad, drove it way deep in the corner. Blaney even deeper. He's going to have to take the line away. Brad gives it up. Brad just says, all right, you want to run this hard this early, go ahead. Got a little more car than I got right now. Well, these two Penske cars battle for no. the lead. Although Brad's not done. He tries it <laughs> really deep. He did. He's trying to upset the back of this 12 car the same way that Blaney was right behind him, right up under that back bumper, taking the air off the spoiler. Brad's trying to do the same thing here in the middle of the corner. You can see it upset the 12. Oh, man. Teammates fighting. You never know they were teammates the way they're working against each other. Brad, he's going to another team next year. He doesn't have to take care of this guy. Oh, man. He slides up almost into the door of the 12. You talked about it. They don't know when the race is going to end. They're driving like this is the last lap, not like there's 102 to go. Their teammate. Joey Logano's up to the 10th position. He's like, my teammates are up there. I want to go race with them. Brad draws right back up to the bumper. What you want to do right now if you're Blaney, you want to run a little bit lower than you normally would. Just run, get that car just a little bit lower on the racetrack to keep Brad Kozlowski from doing exactly that, pushing the air underneath your car, taking grip away oh, from the Oh, he gets into him. Had to think there was contact right there. Brad's going to. Maybe drop back and let him have Yeah, I think that's a smart move. That's I think exactly what happened. Brad could have raced up there and charged into the corner side by side, but I think Brad let him recover, get back in front, say, look, that's my fault. Let's take a look here. Yeah, a little contact right there. Yeah, so Brad could have just continued to accelerate, 
Enter turn one, just, just a lot of gone. Just hard racing, man, that's good stuff. Brad just showing respect, saying, look, I got into you, my fault. I'm not gonna drive into turn three next to you. That's good, hard racing, but respectful racing. And Harvick's like, no, 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 drive in there next to him. Hit him again, I'm coming. Well, you'll see it if it happens right here on Nonstop. between Brad Keselowski, Ryan Blaney, his teammate, as these two battle for the lead. They've been swapping the lead back and forth, contact. These two guys are teammates. You wouldn't know it, toe no, to toe. Not. <laughs> Exchanging punches. Roger Pinsky is here. He's at the track watching this happen between his two cars. Look at that. I think Blaney, I think Blaney had big trouble right there. Had to, had to stay out of the gas way longer than Brad. Brad's using, you said it, Steve, using that Harvick line. We saw Harvick just keep pushing that line on corner exit off turn four. Well, Kozlowski's been using it to his advantage. Blaney driving so defensive, kind of taking both lanes, allowing the two have the inside, but he can't clear him. You said Blaney, you thought he had the long, best long run car. That long run better get here quick. <laughs> well, it's a short run in every long run. <laughs> Look at that right there, Keselowski. Really good turn with that car. Now he's going to try to just stay right here. I love, Blaney with the forward momentum, though. I love how these cars are racing with each other, how they're affected by each other, how Brad is using his car to upset that 12 car and vice versa. When Brad gets the lead, Blaney goes right to the back bumper and takes the air off the spoiler. Here's a situation, though, where Blaney's got a little room, hopefully a little more comfortable car. Brad's going to try to dive back in there and try to get back in position and upset this car. Again, Blaney misses the middle of the corner a little bit. Well, you mentioned Roger Penske, he was here. Remember the Daytona 500 all the way back at the beginning of the year. It was Penske 1-2. They block, they take each other out, someone else wins. Surely he's thinking the same thing right here. Guys, race hard, but don't let that four into the picture. Yeah, you said it, the four car. Kevin Harvick drove right up to the back of this battle here. Blaney that time ran a much lower exit of turn two to his advantage. Was able to get away from Keselowski. Right there is where Blaney is struggling just past the middle of three and four. 
I can't tell if the skies are darker or the brakes are hotter, but you can definitely see the front rotors glow on these front three cars. Right on board the Bushlight Apple Cam, Kevin Harvick, and you can see the different lines and the approach to the corners these guys take. So fun to watch a driver change his line, move around. They, they're all using a higher entry. And no one, look at Keselowski. Too. Yeah. No one would have thought you'd be running there. Oh, we got a car on the wall, Reddick. Yeah, made contact in the middle of three and four. You see the damage on the right side, shaking it back and forth. Trying to get the debris off the tires. You pick up a ton of debris, running way up out of the groove right there. So he's just trying to clean them tires up. Doesn't look like there's a ton of damage in that car. He certainly hopes it's going to continue on when have the pace. I didn't hit it that hard. There you go. I didn't hit it that hard. We're good. He's going to regroup and try to get himself back under control here. All four rotors on that car burning. The rear top rotors, not just the front. Working hard here to stay ahead of Alex Bowman, not give up his position. He's had a great run today, but he's sitting right now just inside the top 10. A little bit too loose, doesn't have the rear grip he's looking for. Alex Bowman sees a weakness. He's like, I'm gonna pressure you, man. I see you struggling. Back up front. Look at the Xfinity fastest lap. Kevin Harvick right there in second, but Blaney with a 30-29. Takes the top spot. As we ride on board with Kevin Harvick right behind him, Eric Amarola has put together some really nice laps. The last three or four laps have been faster than Harvick. Did not have Eric Amarola inside the top five here today. Just had a difficult year. But they are improving. And this is a track where they have a lot of great notes from this four car. The success that the Kevin Harvick team has had here. Marty, what you got? Can you see why this race has been circled on Eric Almirola's calendar for a couple of months? He told me that this morning. He said, this is a racetrack. Honestly, I feel like we can come and we can win the race. And they are certainly showing it right now in fourth. And how about Joey Logano? That is a pass on the 42 car of Ross Chastain for the seventh position. Yes, the same driver that was two laps down, in essence, to start this race when they had a piece of debris in the throttle body, took it out, took the two lap penalty. They're now back on the lead lap and in the top 10 and running some pretty quick lap times. And Steve, to answer your question, yes, it's getting darker down here now. Sunset officially, not a, not till an hour away, but it's getting dark quick here in New Hampshire. An overcast day, so it's gonna get dark very quickly. NASCAR, once again, if you didn't catch it at the end of stage two, they let all the teams know we are going to run as many laps as possible. When we see that it's imminent, we cannot finish the race. We're gonna let the teams know 10 more laps will be the checkered flag as we see the 10 car moved in the inside of four of Kevin Harvick. Dylan, what you got on the four cars he's fading back? Well, I think something for both of these Stuart Haas racing cars to keep in mind, you know, this is a low downforce track and they really struggled in some of the higher downforce, lower, lower horsepower racetracks. So I think they both expected and Rodney specifically on this four car expected that this was maybe going to open the door up for them because this is a real handling racetrack, a place where sometimes having a good driving car is better than having one that just has outright speed. And they've obviously got a really good understanding, as you guys have alluded to, of what makes a race car go around this racetrack well. So I think this was expected. Maybe don't know if they expected to run quite this well, but it certainly has been a pleasant surprise for both the 10 and the 4 of Harvick that they've had as good a days as they've had. Pleasant surprise for Stuart Haas Racing, and you heard Dale Jarrett and Kyle Petty talk about it. Pleasant surprise for the Blue Oval. Look on the left-hand side. Forward, 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 forward. They take the top four spots. Legato makes five of the top seven. 82 laps to go. Ryan Blaney leads the field. We're going to go NASCAR nonstop.
Back at New Hampshire Motor Speedway, and you're watching the leader and the fastest car on the racetrack, Ryan Blaney, continue to lead here. Latart, you said he's the best car here on the long run, and now we're starting to see it. He is. One concern I have about these cars, though, you said it. When they drop the green, they're going to run as hard as they have run because of the darkness. Well, look at this 12. The bright yellow wheels really show it. The rear wheel, clean, still yellow. The front, it might as well be a black one, and that's why look at that front rotor glow cooking those front brakes. Now, I think the brakes are fine. They'll hold up. But those front tires, we have seen front tire failures here when the brakes get so hot, they melt the bead, down they go. We've only on a 34-lap run, but there's 75 laps to go in this race. I mean, look how much brake he is using into turn three. I wonder, though, if, you know, as we're getting closer, closer to darkness, it's just this is this is actually just more evident because of how dark it is getting. It could be, but I'm more nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was as a as somebody just listening. I was hearing that crew chief worry. Drivers like yeah. it's all right. Ah, no sorry, problem. It's just getting dark. Not it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Your just reference Don't even look too. at it. All right, let's go for some updates. Start with Marty. How about Kyle Larson? We were talking in the break about how all the Hendrick Motorsports cars kind of went four different directions for today's race. Well, Larson looking pretty good, sitting in fifth right now. He said it fired off much better on this run. He did have an issue with the water pressure light flashing in the car. Cliff Daniel said it's fine. Don't worry about it. He's having a nice battle with Christopher Bell. Larson in fifth. Bell back there in six. And remember that big swing that we talked about that Adam Stevens was planning on taking on that stop? Well, it worked. Remember, Bell was struggling to stay in the top ten before this. Now challenging for the top five, Dylan. Hey, how about a tip of a cap to the Ross Chastain who runs in the eighth spot? He's been inside the top ten all afternoon long, and they really were battling the handling of that race car just a few uh, a few laps ago, right in the middle of stage two. He said, this thing wants to spin out on entry and plowed through the center. So they really had their hands full, made a couple of adjustments on it. Ross Ross has done a good job. As you see there, he's been inside the top 10 all day long, runs in the eighth spot right now, putting together a really, really solid day of execution for this 42 car. On the other hand, the nine car, Chase Elliott, he's been up front all afternoon long. A slow pit stop last time down at the end of stage two, relegated them back to 15th, which is where he runs right now. So this is a place they knew coming in wasn't going to be their best, knew they would have to execute, do everything perfectly to get a good finish. One small mistake on pit road really has derailed their afternoon, Marty. And Dylan, do not count out Eric Almirola yet. Mike Bugaravich is on top of the pit box, cheering him on every lap, telling him you're faster than the two, you are better than the 12, you can go get these guys. And Jeff, I would say with the playoffs sitting right in front of the 10 and your crew chief cheering you on, I mean, look, Brad Kozlowski in second is right in front of him. I think they can see the win. What would he do to make it happen? Not only can see the win, Marty, but see the playoffs are where they are. And that would absolutely upset oh. this entire playoff field if Eric Amarola get this win. Well, I mean, look at the left side. You see the playoff standings. You know what you don't see? Eric Amarola, 27th in points, 27th coming in. A win and inside the top 30 in points puts you into the playoffs. Kurt Busch won a week ago. We said this at the top of the show. That was kind of like a warning shot across the bow of all these other drivers that other teams can go to victory lane. If the 10 car wins here with two road courses and a restricted play track as well, I'm not even sure Kevin Harvick can feel great. Well, listen, let's talk about Eric Amarola, not just because he's the third, because he's the fastest car. Right. I mean, he is running these guys down almost every lap he is the fastest car. The fastest car. Yeah, I am. <laughs> It's great when you don't have to sell. I was well. I was wondering, like, uh, you know, your crew chief, Steve, and what? I mean, you 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 know all this information, right? What are you going to tell your driver to keep him motivated? Maybe you don't see anything. He's doing everything right right now. So I said earlier, I try to keep people calm when it comes to confrontation. I would flip it. If I got in front of the two as we were running Blaney down, I would be very clear that, listen, this win is more valuable to us than it is to him. And make sure he knows it, and we're going to have to race him that way. And if I'm Blaney's crew chief or the two's crew chief, I'm thinking I'm a little worried about this guy because he's desperate. He's not going to be quite as polite as perhaps the teammates were to one another. Looking at Brad here, I wonder how, how hard he might race this 10 car. He sees how quickly Eric is running down. Thought for a second there that Brad might be letting him have the spot off of turn two, but Brad continues to race hard here for second place. We've had a lot of talk about darkness with 67 laps to go. These teams cannot make it to the finish on fuel. 42 laps on this run. We think they can go 85, maybe 90. 
So somewhere around 15 <laughs> to go, they would definitely need fuel as the 10 goes for a big slide. Yeah, Eric did a great job of running high, enter the corner, through the middle, then turned underneath Brad. Brad's not going to give the spot up. This is going to be a tough pass for Eric. And as Brad makes this difficult, you see the wiggle in the 10 cars taking. Up. We're getting further from the leader. That's right. It's taking a little more pace out of this 10 car. The harder he has to work, the slap traffic not helping. Eric very much. Man, I never like when somebody tells the driver to put the bumper to somebody. Brad's had his chances. Smithley, oh, Smithley he, tried to get out of the way there. The 10 car had a little slip into turn one. You hear it coming from the box, from the from the top, saying he's had his chances. Move him out of the way. I, I just The driver's got to do what he needs to do, what he's comfortable with. The other thing, sometimes I will say that I on the radio, do though. Do it exactly to him what he do to you. There you go. Do exactly to them. This is one of those uh, take what you need moments. That's a take what you need moment. Yep. Drive right up the racetrack. Take his line away. Force Brad back to the bottom. Now you have the position and momentum off the corner. And that's how you pass somebody. Isn't that Put the hammer off here. Let's go. You can hear the intensity in the voice of his spotter and crew chief. I mean, he's right there. The brightest car on the track. You can't miss him. He's well, only 25 car lengths in front of you. You're the fastest car. You're good. That car be so high. And, and by the way, making that pass, Amarillo is still faster than Blaney. Oh, that yeah. lap, even making that pass. You know, we talked about the news with Matt Benedetto, and we've seen Ganassi gets sold, and all of this movement through the garage area. If you're somebody like Eric Amarola, you want to you want to remind everybody how valuable you are as a driver. It has been an absolute horrible year for this 10 car. We said 27th point. You want to remind your partners how great you are. You want to remind Ford, Stuart Haas Racing, why you're driving this 10 car. And not only them, but you. You yourself, you lose confidence in what is going on here. The team loses confidence. That makes it even that much more difficult to perform. So there's there's two situations here. If I'm a driver, Eric, okay, you drive up there and you get back here to the back of this 12 car. You, you put yourself in position and take the lead. Well, you don't know when this race is going to end. If it goes to the finish, you're going to need fuel. You're going to need to stop. When do you do that? When do you make this choice? When do you commit to running to the very end? You're going to have guys coming to pit road to gamble that this race is going to see 301 laps. And then you're going to have guys like Eric or someone else that might have to gamble that this race ends early and I need to stay on the track for that all-important win. Yeah, and the challenge is these guys are give or take 20 laps short. So to your point, other guys aren't going to wait that long. They're going to pit first. As you see, the 10 closed right on the rear bumper of the 12. I think you cannot pit from the lead until you need fuel. You can't. You just hope it falls your way. Marty. You see, they've reminded Eric Almarola several times. His spotter, Joel Edmonds, remember the 12 and the 2 raced really hard at the start of this run. He used his tires up then. Go after it right now. So still the coaching going on, Steve. Yeah, I mean, coaching, and it's so much more fun to coach the fastest car on the racetrack. And tons of lap traffic right in front of Ryan Blaney. Cody Ware did a really nice job and gave both the 12 and the 10 corner exit. Get back to clean air, you'll jump on him. Oh, he's on him. This 12 car, look at that. The full, so much speed for the 10 through the middle of one and two. He yeah. can almost get to the Go, 50 on your tires. Car. Slow high ahead, 34. Lane is struggling. He just does not have near the speed as 10 of Amarola does. Look at that right there. Look at how Amarola just rolls the high side. Oh, here it comes. Big exit there. No, I thought he had more momentum. I thought he was going to drive to the bottom right there. McDowell yeah. trying to run his race, but at the same time trying to stay out of the mix. That, that takes the line away that Eric needs. It cost him a little time here. Eric really using that higher line in one and two to his advantage. Dives down low here in three and four. Can he make it stick to the inside of the 12? Too much momentum for the 12 on corner exit. But now, now Blaney knows if this 10's willing to go anywhere. Oh, Blaney slips up the racetrack. Side by side off turn two, down the back straightaway, Eric Amarola. Oh, Blaney hanging on that outside. That's gonna make it difficult for the 10 here on corner exit. Man, he's so close. 
you can see big advantage for that car on the outside. So, so Almirola has been the fast car on the racetrack, but he's been doing it by running that second lane, that third lane. To get by Blaney, he's going to have to figure something else out. He's going to have to learn what his car will do somewhere other than that lane, because Blaney's not going to give it to him. He's not going to give him that outside. Yeah, and the points on the left, anytime the 10 takes the lead, they completely shift a huge ramifications for the playoffs. See right there, you see the 10 car. It wiggled, it shook. That's because he's having to turn the wheel more, get the car pointed. That hurts the drive, that hurts the rear grip. He's wanting to jump on the outside. Blaney really loose right there, Dylan. Really he loose. Just, yeah, and he just came on the radio and said he's backing into the corner, trying to do everything to hold off the 10. It may not be enough. Oh, now Eric can drive it in the corner. Just overdrive it, slide up in front of Blaney right here. There you go. So well done by Eric Amarola. And on the left-hand side, he becomes leader. Redick on the bubble, only eight points above Dylan. This run to the regular season is going to be great, and if Eric can close this race out today, it is going to be pressure packed for all of those drivers. Well, look at Harvey. Yeah. Only 84 of the good right now. With some very, very difficult races coming. Two road courses at Daytona. Just shocking to see the speed of this 10 car. Eric's had a solid car all day, running well inside the top 10, but we got cars on pit road, Dylan. Yeah, here's Chase Elliott in. So remember, they had that slow stop last time that really sent them down the leaderboard. So four tires and fuel. This should be routine to maybe kick off the cycle here. We're going to see if this kicks off the cycle. So now if you're the 10, you ask the question, when do you pit? I can't pit from the lead first. It's really who do I think can make up enough time on new tires? The 12, the 2, they're kind of within distance. Harvick, three and a half second back. I have to worry about him. And there you have it. The two of Brad Kozlowski, a left-hand court turn on the pit road. Did he make the line, though? It he had to be close. It. Marty. Brad Kozlowski hitting pit road. He said, the drive is hurting me the worst, and the entry is no longer great. We'll see if he got on pit road clean as the green flag cycle begins here. 53 to go. We'll see when the rest of the leaders come down pit road. I, I feel my gut is turning for the crew chief of the 10. What do you do? Do you take your driver out of the lead and try to counter what these other guys are doing? Because pit road is filling up with lead lap cars. Marty. See Denny Hamlin on pit road, four fresh Goodyear tires. He had driven his way back up to the 13th position when he came down pit road. Remember, they had that problem on the last stop. Restarted 26 to 13th, Dylan. Kevin Harvick is in, just reporting that he's losing rear grip again. That's been their biggest challenge all afternoon long, trying to keep that rear of the car in the racetrack, four tires and fuel for Harvick. There's the question. The 10 of Eric Almiroli has to come. Brad Kozlowski forces his hand with 52 laps to go. He came a lap earlier. We'll see if those fresh tires and the cycle will change the lead. Dylan. And Alex Bowman pulled out right in front of the 12 of Ryan Blaney. So we'll see if that costs him any time. Right side Goodyear is going on just way too loose. The report for Blaney, we saw it there. They'll make it a four tire change in fuel, Marty. The pressure on the pit crew still. And now Aaron Dalmarola got to the lead. Let's see if the pit crew can keep him there. A terrific stop for the team. He wanted no changes to the chassis. The 10 with a nice stop. They deliver on pit road. Let's see where it all cycles out. Well, there you go. You see this is Brad Keselowski entering turn one at speed where the 10 is going to have to use this very slick apron what a job by eric almirola the 10 pit crew spectacular work to come to pit road second and to keep that lead over the two is great a great job by eric almirola the driver getting on the pit road with no practice you don't get to try that you have to do it live easy to make a mistake easy to get caught speeding great job by almirola sticker tires will be a little bit edgy for this first lap or two, first corner or two for the 10, so the two car could to continue to close over these next couple corners. There you see it. And that's where he's been the best. The two has been really good on short runs. And on the left-hand side, Chastain, Matty D, Byron Wallace, they're all staying on the racetrack hoping for darkness or something to end this race before they have to come to pit road. But you mentioned it, Brad Kozlowski on the bumper of the 10. I think Brad's got to push really hard right here. Take advantage of the advantage you have, and that is short run speed. Get by Amarola. Now, now in my opinion, 
You only have to be in front of him by three or four car lengths. Get in front of him, right, drive away, and then chill out a little bit. You just saw Almirola has the best long run car. Don't give him any more of an advantage than you have to. Jeff, how many times, for how many years, have we seen Team Penske short run speed? It is breathtaking. Richmond, Martinsville, Phoenix, New Hampshire, it doesn't matter what track these Penske cars fire off on cold tires. Look at this. Oh, the oh. seven car hot into the corner. Way up in the dirty, dirty debris up there. He's going to gather it in, keep it off the wall. Good job. Or a joy. Nice job saving that car. So slick up there. Now 10 cars tires appear to be coming back in. And if Amarola, you're going to push as hard as you can right here. There's no saving tire. You know you got the best long run car. Go push. Chastain to pit road, finishing his pit stop. The 21 of Matt DiBenedetto, you know, in the news this week, lose this ride for the Wood Brothers. He won't be in it next year. They're going to stay out on the racetrack, continue to try to gamble, try to make something happen. But when the cycle completes, this will be the race for the win, barring some crazy circumstances. See, Bubba Wallace in third place is going to give that position up to Brad Kozlowski. Eric has to just go back to work, do what he did the last time. And I agree with what you said, Jeff. Brad only needs to be so far in front of the 10. Don't burn your stuff up. And if you're the 10, you just want to keep him within eyesight because you feel like you came on last time after, what, 10 or 15 laps. Yeah, remember the difference in this situation with Keselowski is he's not battling anyone. At the start of that last run, he and Blaney had an epic battle. They went after each other. That was hard on both of those guys' tires this time. He can run wherever he wants to run. Keselowski can put the car where he wants to put it, can drive it the way he wants to drive it, and that's easier on tires, Junior, than having to battle someone. Now you see the 10 car moving around, trying to find that magic in that high line of turn one and two that he had before, and it's working for him. He's closing in a little bit here on the two car. As the two and the 10 battle, top of the screen, 21. You can see last time pit road to lap 188. He's currently in first. It's going to take a little bit of a miracle for this to work out, but I like the game right here. I love the gamble. I think it's a great call. Oh, here we go. Amarola all over Keselowski. He's got the outside position on Brad down here in turn three and four. Brad gets a little bit loose, loses grip. Up the racetrack he goes. The 10 car in the throttle. Corner exit takes that position away. What a drive by Eric Almarola. You take the lead. You have a pit stop. Brad comes and takes it back. Not the lead, but the, the first car off pit road that we know can make it on fuel. He puts laps together to run the two back down. Just a very impressive run by the 10 car. Impressive run, impressive race car. These guys have brought, we, Stuart Haas just hasn't been where we expect them to be. And I think they would even admit that the, their company as a whole is lacking a little pace. But man, today they have run well with Harvick winning the stage. Eric Almirola in a position to shock the Cup Series just like last weekend with Kurt Busch and turn this point system upside down. Five races left to go into the playoffs. We're going to keep this battle going with NASCAR nonstop.
the world's biggest show on the world's biggest stage, the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics, Friday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on NBC. Guys, we're, I'm pumped. We're, I'm we're closing in on, on darkness now. We know the sun sets around 8.30, but it's overcast, so the darkness is gonna happen a little earlier. And what you're seeing with these cameras that we have, it looks a little better, a little lighter than it, what it actually is out on the racetrack. And we watch watching Brad Kozlowski work his way, him and Christopher Bell having a heck of a battle here for third place. So Jeff, you and I covered though the Gordon win at Martinsville, pre-lights at Martinsville. Yes. It was much darker than this. Oh, yeah. Now I know oh, that's yeah. a slower track and a different and a different look, but currently with Matty D out there leading, 10 second lead over Eric Amarola. Matty D has about 10 or 12 laps left of fuel. He's hoping, Marty, I would assume, even if he doesn't get the call for darkness, a yellow, and he'll probably be able to pit and restart somewhere inside the top 10. And I think that's his strategy, Steve. They're hoping, of course, that it maybe is called because of darkness. Matty D on the radio a moment ago saying, it's the darkest I've ever seen it at a racetrack. Of course, he is going to say that, but I agree with what you guys just said. Our cameras really brighten up the picture for everyone at home. I was there that night. Jeff Gordon won at Martinsville. It's nowhere near like it is right now. That was nowhere near at that moment. Much darker that time. So I think Matty D just hoping for something to happen. Happen, but a nice move by Jonathan Hassler nonetheless, keeping him out. And yes, you're right, Steve, about 10, 12 more laps off to be at pit road no matter what. We got 33 laps to go. It's projected to end without a caution at around 820. So I think we get the whole race in. I believe their hopes of this race ending short. It's gonna be a little bit difficult to make that happen. Now a caution could change that. That's right, you could know, drag things out. Well, I think a caution, NASCAR said, you know, hey, we're gonna give you a 10 lap window. I think if we see a yellow, NASCAR at that point would have to say somewhere around the restart, listen guys, you get 10 laps. We, we can't, you know, we gotta put some sort of definitive end to this race. But right now, this fans that filled these grandstands, they have the chance to see all 301 laps, I think. And Matt, you know, he only has a less than an eight second lead. He's losing a lot of time on the racetrack. Won't be able to maintain this lead for many more laps. Yeah, I mean, he's about losing a second. A second yeah, yeah, about a second. Even you and I can do that, man. Yeah, right <laughs> right there, 30, eight, 50 eight, to 30, 150, carry the 12 laps. <laughs> <laughs> All the emotions. Think about the emotions in Matty D right now. A tough week. He's not going to be back in his car next year. Sitting there. Just needs a break, right? Needs something good to happen. The right caution to come out at the right time. Needs something to happen. He can see, man, I'm in this position. And then behind him, Eric Amarola had a terrible year. He has the same thoughts in his head. I don't want any cautions. He's saying, I want this thing to go green the whole way. And right behind Eric Amarola is Christopher Bell, who has run the fastest lap on the racetrack the last time by. He's only a couple of seconds behind. Eric Almiroli has passed Brett Kozlowski for third position, so this 20 car could factor in if Matt DiBeno comes to pit road, Eric Almirola might have a fight on his hands. Yeah, and Bell's thinking, I'm gonna, I've seen Kyle Busch do the double. I've seen Truex win a couple in a weekend. I wanna, I'm a Gibbs guy, let me win a couple in a weekend. One of the 54 yesterday, third Xfinity race in a row here at New Hampshire. He knows how to do it, and he's making his car the best when it matters most. So let's listen into the second place current position car of the 10, Eric Amarola. The 20 just passed the two. He's still a third of a straightaway back. We got it last 30 laps. Four. I'm going to turn him loose here when you tell me. Go, 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 go. Going to turn him loose. What? He's been holding back a little bit. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> wonder if Eric knows that. He might be saying, man, I win. I'm going. Well, Eric now is five seconds behind the 21 of Matty D. Christopher Bell just ran a 30-44 to Eric Almarola's 30-70. At, I don't know, man. That 20 car is coming. Man, you know, whatever they did on that green flag pit stop, this 20 car has come to life. Amarola answered with a 60, and, and Bell ran a 54. It's going to come down, I believe, to this 10 car getting through the lap traffic. It's catching some pretty fast race cars. This 23 car has got a little bit newer tire, and the 9 car. He's got more pace than those guys, but he's getting by them. It's another thing. Great yeah. battle right here. There's Matty D coming on pit road. So a great try. I mean, I applaud the effort. Unbelievable situation that Matty D is in and his crew chief just trying to put him in the best situation he can. Now it's basically what you see is what you got. Almirola the lead, Bell 1.6 seconds back. Keselowski, Blaney, Harvick, Logano. 
somehow has driven back up into the top six. Let's take a look here. That's the distance from first to second right there. Christopher Bell on the right side of the screen as he tries to close in. Now, Long time to go, 26 laps. It's a lot of laps at this track. The cars are going to go through some changes. Eric Almirola, you see the speeds at the line right there. Almirola, third quick. Bell a little slower with traffic. Keselowski, a nice lap. Logano, once again, continues to put great laps together. He just needed a yellow to close up the field. Almirola right now is thinking, I hope I gained some goodwill back in those races that weren't going my way when I laid over for people and gave them a little bit of a break. Hopefully, they'll give me a break. William Byron was playing that same strategy that Matty D was playing. William Byron on pit road right now. When that type of strategy strategy doesn't work, it's lost. Okay, suit. I'm ready for the 10 to go. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> That's a spotter and the crew chief talking on this channel too. But look, this has been a long race and a long day, but these 25 laps are gonna be way longer. 25 laps to go for Eric Almirola to get this win and completely change this entire year right here today. I think at this point, we talked about what kind of information you give Eric Almirola earlier when he's when you're pushing him, trying to get him to get up there and take control of this race. What kind of information you give him now? Now, I'm basically just letting him know it's 24 to go. I feel you have the car. Don't panic him about Bell. Don't let him be surprised. Say, hey, Bell's now in second. He's been a little bit quicker than Keselowski, so you know as the leader in the mirror. Okay, that's the Plenty dark. Racing. Plenty dark. Right? Yeah, that's what I was he's thinking. the leader. got dark, and I, I hear what he's saying. That's what I'd be telling him. Though. I'd be letting him know Bell's the guy you're worried about. You're definitely fast enough. Pick and choose your position. Focus on the lap part. And, and you hear him say that. And I, I mean, if that's Eric talking about the darkness, and, and I'm a driver, and I would think the same thing. I'm in the lead now. Okay, it's dark. NASCAR is dark. You're going to start talking about that, thinking that, and that is going to. When you're not thinking that, when you're thinking about that, you're not running your best line. You're not running exactly how you need to run, and I think it's good to crew chief to come back on the radio and say, hey, man, don't worry about that. We're handling that. We don't need it. We don't need this too dark. You're going to win this race in 22 laps. Quit worrying about shortening this race. Yeah. You have the car. You have the position. If you do what you do for 22 laps, dark, light, let them call it. We don't care. We're going to win this race. Show a little confidence in what we're doing. Well, and they're not listening to you anyway. <laughs> You're the yeah. last person yeah. they're going to listen to. They don't care what you think. I Eric. mean, because it's, they're just trying to influence their decision. Eric continues to run some great laps, though. He's driving away from Christopher Bale and Brad Kozlowski. To your point about focus, remind him, hey, don't forget about your tools, yeah. your brake bias, your other things. Don't be thinking about other things. Don't get out of the moment. That's where I think lap time, that's where that can become a really useful tool for a driver. It's just your goal is to run the same lap time you ran the lap before, right? Get that information from your dashboard. Get it from your spotter, however you get it, and that's your goal. It's just your lap time. Forget all the, if we win this race, and all those things. What you got to focus on is you and your race car. And if the 22 is not fortunate enough to get a yellow, I believe he's faster than the 4 and the 12. They're going to go home thinking, man, what if? What if we could have just ran this race up inside the lead lap most of the day? Because, you know, they lost a lot of time, some adjustments, just not much of a race for the 22 running most of it laps down. Give Christopher Bell and his team a lot of credit, right? They've made their car right at the right moment, continued to make improvements all day long. He's driven, Bell's driven three seconds away from Keselowski. Joey Logano. He's going to go to the outside of this four car down the front straightaway. Basically started this race two laps down, fought and clawed into the top five. So now we have a situation where the 10 is in recently clean air. The 20 is catching him relatively quickly. Let's take a look. We're going to look at speeds at the wow. line next time by. I mean, the 20 is only. Oh. NASCAR said it. Ten to go, to go right this here. time by, Dale Jr. Ten to go. Ten to go. Hit your mark. Put it smart. That couldn't have come any quicker for Eric Almiroli. Run a 31 flat, uncharacteristically slow lap for Eric, and he's gave up a little bit of time to Christopher Bell. You see it right there, 133, 1.4. 1, 1. And let's remind everybody, that's 10 laps regardless. Green, yellow, doesn't matter. No overtimes. We are going to run 10 more laps in any flag condition to end this race. Here it comes off turn four, getting the single nine laps to go. He looks in the mirror, sees that 20 car getting a little bit bigger. Let's see, speeds at the line. Almirola, good lap that time, a little quicker I than Bell. Quicker than him last lap. Oh, and the crew chief reminds him that was quicker. 
I'm looking at the data. You're quicker. Nine to go. Now it's a focus on lap cars. Don't get hung up behind a lap car. Don't give up a second. It'd be easy to do. It'd be easy to get hung up on a lap car. See right there, catching Austin Dillon. Austin is sitting there running in 17th place. Not a slow car, so this will not be an easy pass for Eric. Yeah, let's see how the three affects the 10, right? So this time right here, look at that. Bell quicker. Almost the same time, but quicker. I tell you what, it's in Austin Dillon's best interest for Christopher Bell to run him down and pass him. Austin Drake. Dillon does not want a new winner. The last thing he wants uh -uh. is to go win. That's a good point. That moves him out of the playoffs. And we saw last week, you know, these other cars can't affect the race win. Dillon's going to run a tidy line at the bottom. This is why he doesn't want it. Look what it does. It puts Austin Dillon below the cut line with Almarola winning. And, Unreal. And that one right there, that was over a tenth of a second. Bell ran faster than Almarola that time. It's hard to pass here anyway, guys. It's really hard to pass in this racetrack. So Austin Dillon just has to keep doing what he's doing. He's not blocking. He's not doing anything other than running the fastest lap that he can right here. As you mentioned, right, he, he's not multiple laps down. He's yeah. the last car in the lead lap. He's fighting to stay in the lead lap. He should make this really difficult on Eric. Eric, Eric almost in the wall, in the wall right there. He's pressing. He knows he's losing time. He can see it. He doesn't need the radio. He can see in the mirror. That was two and a half tenths of a second right there. Christopher Bell is under a second behind now. Eric just is not Get able back. to find a way around this clown. <sighs> Eric just not able to really run the line and maximize what he was doing in turn one and two there. Look at the brake temperature on the 10. Front rotors glowing as he tries to get to the outside of the three. Oh, he wants, he wants to be right on that quarter panel. Can't do it. Christopher Bell getting closer. Now Alvarola saying, look, I need this spot. Alvarola's going to get aggressive right here. What's a three going to do? Oh, he's going right on his quarter panel. Eric, Eric's oh, yeah. going to take his line away. That, he has to do that. I know that Austin's not going to love that. But the 10 car has no other choice. If it's fair for the three to run hard in front of him, it's fair for the 10 to take what he needs to win a race. That 100%. is what he like to see. It's great hard racing. 100% right. Nope, everybody did everything right right there. Now can the 10 car of Eric Amarola right, get back in his run. rhythm? Trying to get you a little help. Now get your mark car. Smooth, he won't catch you. Four more. Four more laps to go. Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch. He won a race with lap traffic a week ago in Atlanta. What will he do now that Eric Almarola is on his rear bumper? Oh, he pulls to the left. The veteran shows the other veteran a bunch of class. Eric does a good job there, stopping the car in the middle of the corner, getting a great exit here, good straight run off the corner. Now there's a lap car in between the two. Three laps to go. See what Kurt Busch does. He's going to run around the bottom of the racetrack. 77 taking that 10 cars line away, not his preferred line, having to run a little bit lower. You can see it cost him a little bit. Kurt Busch once again showing why he's a champion, gets out of the way of these guys. Haley pulls to the left. He wants no part of this battle. The gap down to half a second. Clean air here, clean track for Eric Amarola. Sit out Junior, the next guy in front of Amarola. Eric, at this point, just hit your marks. Think about nothing else. Don't even look in the mirror. The shot heard across the playoff leaderboard. Eric Amarola leads with under two laps to go. Gets that car turned off of turn four. One lap to go presented by Credit One Bank for Eric Almarola down into turn one. Aiming to get his third career win in his 374th start. Last win was at Talladega in October of 2018. This is going to put Eric Almarola into the playoffs. If he can make it through turns three and four, he's got lap cars in front. But the lead is a little bit too big for Christopher Bell. Eric Almarola with the upset at New Hampshire. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Never quit fighting. You got, even when you feel like 
The world's about to end. Never quit fighting. No playoff racing. How about that? <laughs> you love to hear the happiness in the voice of these guys when they do something great. You can tell this guy here appreciates what he's done today. They turned their, they turned their season around. 27th in the points. First, Not a threat. Yeah, first win this year for Stuart Haas Racing. Yep. Nobody, nobody had them on their radar today. They turned it on late in this race. My goodness. Best car won. Yep. They had the fastest race car. We think we can predict what's going to happen in the sport two weeks in a row. We get the unpredictable results with Kurt Busch winning in Atlanta. Now Eric Alvarola punches his ticket to the playoffs. It makes that bubble battle a lot more interesting. And Junior now two road course races and a super speedway race at Daytona. <laughs> what could happen? This is your checker flag moment. Brought to you by Advance Auto Parts. Burn it now. These fans have stuck around all day long through the weather delay. And saw some awesome racing here in the last two days in New Hampshire. This racetrack's a lot of fun. These fans up here love racing. Stuart Haas might be on the uptick here. win in the dark for Eric Almirola. Puts himself in the playoffs. Picked a fine time to win the first ever non-super speedway win. He gets it here at New Hampshire. Man, incredible, Eric. Honestly, did you see that performance coming this morning? Honestly, I did. This is by far one of my favorite racetracks. I love coming up to the New England area and racing. I love this racetrack. I, uh, I had this race won a couple years ago, and I gave it away. I lost it. And I am so glad to uh, to win a race here with this race team. Oh, God is so good, man. We've been through so much, and I've just stood the test and uh, kept the faith. The team, everybody, they've just been working so hard. Smithfield, Ford, Go Bowling, Pit Boss Grills, uh, everybody, Honey Singer, Shady Race Sunglasses, there's been so many people that have just continued to support us through like the crappiest year ever. And uh, man, this feels so good for them. My pit crew did a phenomenal job on pit road. All the guys that work on this car, they just keep fighting. They just keep digging, bringing the best race car they can bring every week. And it is no doubt we have struggled, but guess what? We're going playoff racing. <laughs> hey, how about those last 50 laps? Maybe the hardest you've driven in your career because you had to beat Ryan Blaney, Brad Keselowski, and at the end, Christopher Bell. Yeah, um, yeah, that's what that's what a race car driver lives for. And for so long, I've been so close to winning at some of these racetracks like here, Dover, and I've I've let it slip away. And I, I've honestly hated it, and my wife has hated it worse than I have. She's always told me she's like, "Honey, I want you to win so badly at somewhere other than a restrictor plate racetrack." And we did it today, and gosh, I'm just so proud of everybody at Stuart Haas Racing, Roush Yates Engine Shop. We have been fighting, scratching, clawing, and uh, man, this feels so good to have something pay off for all the, the hard work. So just really happy. Uh, man, this means so much. It's hard, to, it's hard to explain it, but I love coming up here to New England. You fans are awesome in this area. 
Living it up with the fans. He has a checkered flag to collect and also an invite to the 2021 playoffs. How about that, Junior? Love it, man. Love to see that excitement. Love to see the drivers get the checkered flag. Man, you work so hard to win these races. Take that checkered flag home. Coming up next on NBCSN Premier Lacrosse League, the All-Star Game. Guys, we talked about the playoffs and what this win with Eric does to the points. Look at that bubble. I don't dare look at the points. I keep <laughs> looking at the points and we have new winners. So not even on that list is Ricky Stenhouse Jr. who's won at Daytona before. Ross Chastain's running great at the road courses. Matt DeBattadeno runs great at the road courses. So five points is a pressure cooker. I I'm not ready to throw the towel in on more winners. I can tell you who's looking at the points, Richard Childers. He's got two teammates sitting there, 16, 17. Things just got tense at RCR. They got to go to work. I mean, it looked like they were in pretty good shape coming into this race, but now it's game on. Dylan is called up with Christopher Bell. Man, and it was a valiant effort. Almost had the weekend sweep, won the Xfinity Series race yesterday, and, and just uh, a couple laps short today. Had it gone the distance, do you feel like you, you had a shot at him? Yeah, I, did, I didn't know how many laps they cut us short, but definitely whenever I saw the board and saw that we were eight laps short, it, it stings, man, because I feel like uh, I was probably had a little bit better pace than him and I was able to get to him. I know lap cars were giving him a, a bad time, but I was able to get to him. It was going to be a heck of a race, but really proud of everyone on this Ream, Pristine Auction, Camry. Uh, they did really good. You know, everyone on the 20 group, or 20 group, we didn't start out the greatest, and then we were really good, the best we were all day right there at the end of the race. So that's all you can ask for is to have a shot at it, and uh, yeah, I just wish we had eight more laps. Well, and we watched you all weekend. I mean, your car was working, it seemed like, everywhere. So, I mean, where do you feel like you were better even than, than these Penske Fords that, that were so strong throughout the day? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I fought a little bit of everything, and, you know, I don't, it was a little loose in, a little loose off. Uh, I felt like my car cut the center probably better than theirs, and that's where my speed was. So, um, yeah, I really, I mean, I'm happy for Eric. You know, that's cool for him to win. Uh, he's been close a couple times. So, building on our program, too. So, hopefully, we can knock, knock off a couple more wins here soon. I guess it's a good day if you're disappointed with second, right? Christopher Bell almost had him, but he'll have to settle for the runner up spot today. Yeah, I know Christopher would love to have seen this race finish out but i don't know if he had the pace for this guy catching him is one thing and passing him is another guys we know this place is tough to pass well you always as a driver think man what if right i don't bring christopher bell i think christopher bell was a little bit faster but still quite a ways away to go get him and i think nascar had to make that decision because what if the yellow comes out that takes six or eight minutes right and the closing laps it got very dark right if you get a caution with 11 or 12 to go can they change it then they at least made the decision under green after everybody pitted so i think it was the right decision couldn't be happier nice guy deserves the win he's put in so much work well, we had it all today a lot of drama early on with the wet race track we had guys sliding all over the place stage winners blaney Kevin Harvick and Brad Kozlowski up front, all the players. But we had a big upset when it came down to it. Eric Alvarola took it. Coming up next, Premier Lacrosse League All-Star Game from San Jose, California.